The old timers were incensed by Bean's algorithm transgressing into the hallowed halls of baseball. They said that picking baseball players is an art, and that only humans with an intimate and long standing experience of the game can master it. A computer program could never do it, because it could never decipher the secrets and the spirit of baseball. They soon had to eat their baseball caps. Bean's shoestring budget algorithmic team, $44 million, not only held its own against baseball giants such as the New York Yankees, $125 million, but became the first team ever in American League Baseball to win 20 consecutive games. Not that Bean and Oakland could enjoy their success for long. Soon enough, many other baseball teams adopted the same algorithmic approach, and since the Yankees and Red Sox could pay far more for both baseball players and computer software, low-budget teams such as the Oakland Athletics now had an even smaller chance of beating the system than before.14. In 2004 Professor Frank Levy from MIT and Professor Richard Murnane from Harvard published a thorough research of the job market, listing those professions most likely to undergo automation. Truck drivers were given as an example of a job that could not possibly be automated in the foreseeable future. It is hard to imagine, they wrote, that algorithms could safely drive trucks on a busy road. A mere 10 years later, Google and Tesla not only imagine this, but are actually making it happen. Point 15. In fact, as time goes by, it becomes easier and easier to replace humans with computer algorithms, not merely because the algorithms are getting smarter, but also because humans are professionalizing. Ancient hunter gatherers mastered a very wide variety of skills in order to survive, which is why it would be immensely difficult to design a robotic hunter gatherer. Such a robot would have to know how to prepare spear points from flint stones, how to find edible mushrooms in a forest, how to use medicinal herbs to bandage a wound, how to track down a mammoth and how to coordinate a charge with a dozen other hunters. However, over the last few thousand years we humans have been specializing. A taxi driver or a cardiologist specializes in a much narrower niche than a hunter-gatherer, which makes it easier to replace them with AI. Even the managers in charge of all these activities can be replaced. Thanks to its powerful algorithms, Uber can manage millions of taxi drivers with only a handful of humans. Most of the commands are given by the algorithms without any need of human supervision. Point 16 In May 2014 Deep Knowledge Ventures, a Hong Kong venture capital firm specializing in regenerative medicine, broke new ground by appointing an algorithm called Vital to its board. Vital makes investment. Recommendations by analyzing huge amounts of data on the financial situation, clinical trials, and intellectual property of prospective companies. Like the other five board members, the algorithm gets to vote on whether the firm makes an investment in a specific company or not. Examining Vital's record so far, it seems that it has already picked up one managerial vice, nepotism. It has recommended investing in companies that grant algorithms more authority. With Vital's blessing, Deep Knowledge Ventures has recently invested in Silico Medicine, which develops computer-assisted methods for drug research, and in Pathway Pharmaceuticals, which employs a platform called OncoFinder to select and rate personalized cancer therapies. Point 17. As algorithms push humans out of the job market, wealth might become concentrated in the hands of the tiny elite that owns the all-powerful algorithms, creating unprecedented social inequality. Alternatively, the algorithms might not only manage businesses, but actually come to own them. At present, human law already recognizes intersubjective entities like corporations and nations as legal persons. Though Toyota or Argentina has neither a body nor a mind, they are subject to international laws, they can own land and money, and they can sue and be sued in court. We might soon grant similar status to algorithms. An algorithm could then own a venture capital fund without having to obey the wishes of any human master. If the algorithm makes the right decisions, it could accumulate a fortune, which it could then invest as it sees fit, perhaps buying your house and becoming your landlord. If you infringe on the algorithm's legal rights, say, by not paying rent, the algorithm could hire lawyers and sue you in court. If such algorithms consistently outperform human fund managers, we might end up with an algorithmic upper class owning most of our planet. This may sound impossible, but before dismissing the idea, Remember that most of our planet is already legally owned by non-human intersubjective entities, namely nations, and corporations. Indeed, 5,000 years ago much of Sumer was owned by imaginary gods such as Inki and Inanna. If gods can possess land and employ people, why not algorithms? So what will people do? Art is often said to provide us with our ultimate, 
and uniquely human, sanctuary. In a world where computers replace doctors, drivers, teachers, and even landlords, everyone would become an artist. Yet it is hard to see why artistic creation will be safe from the algorithms. Why are we so sure computers will be unable to better us in the composition of music? According to the life sciences, art is not the product of some enchanted spirit or metaphysical soul, but rather of organic algorithms recognizing mathematical patterns. If so, there is no reason why non-organic algorithms couldn't master it. David Cope is a musicology professor at the University of California in Santa Cruz. He is also one of the more controversial figures in the world of classical music. Cope has written programs that compose concertos, chorales, symphonies, and operas. His first creation was named Emmy, Experiments in Musical Intelligence, which specialized in imitating the style of Johann Sebastian Bach. It took seven years to create the program, but once the work was done, Emmy composed 5,000 chorales a la Bach in a single day. Cope arranged a performance of a few select chorales in a music festival at Santa Cruz. Enthusiastic members of the audience praised the wonderful performance, and explained excitedly how the music touched their innermost being. They didn't know it was composed by Emmy rather than Bach, and when the truth was revealed, some reacted with glum silence, while others shouted in anger. Emmy continued to improve, and learned to imitate Beethoven, Chopin, Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky. Cope got Emmy a contract, and its first album, Classical Music Composed by Computer, sold surprisingly well. Publicity brought increasing hostility from classical music buffs. Professor Steve Larson from the University of Oregon sent Cope a challenge for a musical showdown. Larson suggested that professional pianists play three pieces one after the other, one by Bach, one by Emmy, and one by Larson himself. The audience would then be asked to vote who composed which piece. Larson was convinced people would easily tell the difference between soulful human compositions and the lifeless artifact of a machine. Cope accepted the challenge. On the appointed date, hundreds of lecturers, students, and music fans assembled in the University of Oregon's concert hall. At the end of the performance, a vote was taken. The result? The audience thought that Emmy's piece was genuine Bach, that Bach's piece was composed by Larson, and that Larson's piece was produced by a computer. Critics continued to argue that Emmy's music is technically excellent, but that it lacks something. It is too accurate. It has no depth. It has no soul. Yet when people heard Emmy's compositions without being informed of their provenance, they frequently praised them precisely for their soulfulness and emotional resonance. Following Emmy's successes, Cope created newer and even more sophisticated programs. His crowning achievement was Annie. Whereas Emmy composed music according to predetermined rules, Annie is based on machine learning. Its musical style constantly changes and develops in reaction to new inputs from the outside world. Cope has no idea what Annie is going to compose next. Indeed, Annie does not restrict itself to music composition but also explores other art forms such as haiku poetry. In 2011 Cope published Comes the Fiery Night, 2000 Haiku by Man and Machine. Of the 2000 haikus in the book, some are written by Annie, and the rest by organic poets. The book does not disclose which are which. If you think you can tell the difference between human creativity and machine output, you are welcome to test your claim. Point 18. In the 19th century the Industrial Revolution created a huge new class of urban proletariats, and socialism spread because no one else managed to answer their unprecedented needs, hopes and fears. Liberalism eventually defeated socialism only by adopting the best parts of the socialist program. In the 21st century we might witness the creation of a new massive class, people devoid of any economic, political, or even artistic value, who contribute nothing to the prosperity, power, and glory of society. In September 2013 two Oxford researchers, Carl Benedict Frey and Michael A. Osborne, published The Future of Employment, in which they surveyed the likelihood of different professions being taken over by computer algorithms within the next 20 years. The algorithm developed by Frey and Osborne to do the calculations estimated that 47% of U.S. jobs are at high risk. For example, there is a 99% probability that by 2033 human telemarketers and insurance underwriters will lose their jobs to algorithms. There is a 98% probability that the same will happen to sports referees, 97%er that it will happen to cashiers and 96%er to chefs. Waiters. 94% paralegal assistants, 
94 percenter tour guides, 91 percenter bakers, 89 percenter bus drivers, 89 percenter construction laborers, 88 percenter veterinary assistants, 86 percenter security guards, 84 percenter sailors, 83 percenter bartenders, 77 percenter archivists, 76 percenter carpenters, 72 percenter lifeguards, 67 percenter and so forth. There are of course some safe jobs. The likelihood that computer algorithms will displace archaeologists by 2033 is only 0.7%, because their job requires highly sophisticated types of pattern recognition, and doesn't produce huge profits. Hence it is improbable that corporations or government will make the necessary investment to automate archaeology within the next 20 years. Point 19. Of course, by 2033 many new professions are likely to appear, for example, virtual world designers. But such professions will probably require much more creativity and flexibility than your run-of-the-mill job, and it is unclear whether 40-year-old cashiers or insurance agents will be able to reinvent themselves as virtual world designers, just try to imagine a virtual world created by an insurance agent. And even if they do so, the pace of progress is such that within another decade they might have to reinvent themselves yet again. After all, algorithms might well outperform humans in designing virtual worlds too. The crucial problem isn't creating new jobs. The crucial problem is creating new jobs that humans perform better than algorithms. Point 20. The technological bonanza will probably make it feasible to feed and support the useless masses even without any effort on their side. But what will keep them occupied and content? People must do something, or they will go crazy. What will they do all day? One solution might be offered by drugs and computer games. Unnecessary people might spend increasing amounts of time within 3D virtual reality worlds, which would provide them with far more excitement and emotional engagement than the drab reality outside. Yet such a development would deal a mortal blow to the liberal belief in the sacredness of human life and of human experiences. What's so sacred in useless bums who pass their days devouring artificial experiences in La La Land? Some experts and thinkers, such as Nick Bostrom, warn that humankind is unlikely to suffer this degradation, because once artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence, it might simply exterminate humankind. The AI is likely to do so either for fear that humankind would turn against it and try to pull its plug, or in pursuit of some unfathomable goal of its own. For it would be extremely difficult for humans to control the motivation of a system smarter than themselves. Even pre-programming the system with seemingly benign goals might backfire horribly. One popular scenario imagines a corporation designing the first artificial superintelligence, and giving it an innocent test such as calculating pi. Before anyone realizes what is happening, the AI takes over the planet, eliminates the human race, launches a conquest campaign to the ends of the galaxy, and transforms the entire known universe into a giant supercomputer that for billions upon billions of years calculates pi ever more accurately. After all, this is the divine mission its creator gave it. Point 21. A probability of 87 percenter. At the beginning of this chapter we identified several practical threats to liberalism. The first is that humans might become militarily and economically useless. This is just a possibility, of course, not a prophecy. Technical difficulties or political objections might slow down the algorithmic invasion of the job market. Alternatively, since much of the human mind is still uncharted territory, we don't really know what hidden talents humans might discover, and what novel jobs they might create to replace the losses. That, however, may not be enough to save liberalism. For liberalism believes not just in the value of human beings, it also believes in individualism. The second threat facing liberalism is that in the future, while the system might still need humans, it will not need individuals. Humans will continue to compose music, to teach physics and to invest money, but the system will understand these humans better than they understand themselves, and will make most of the important decisions for them. The system will thereby deprive individuals of their authority and freedom. The liberal belief in individualism is founded on the three important assumptions that we discussed earlier in the book. 1. I am an individual, i.e. I have a single essence which cannot be divided into any parts or subsystems. True, this inner core is wrapped in many outer layers. But if I make the effort to peel these external crusts, I will find deep within myself a clear and single inner voice, which is my authentic self. To my authentic self is completely free. 
3. It follows from the first two assumptions that I can know things about myself nobody else can discover. For only I have access to my inner space of freedom, and only I can hear the whispers of my authentic self. This is why liberalism grants the individual so much authority. I cannot trust anyone else to make choices for me, because no one else can know who I really am, how I feel and what I want. This is why the voter knows best, why the customer is always right and why beauty is in the eye of the beholder. However, the life sciences challenge all three assumptions. According to the life sciences, one organisms are algorithms, and humans are not individuals, they are dividuals, i.e. humans are an assemblage of many different algorithms lacking a single inner voice or a single self. Two the algorithms constituting a human are not free. They are shaped by genes and environmental pressures, and take decisions either deterministically or randomly, but not freely. 3. It follows that an external algorithm could theoretically know me much better than I can ever know myself. An algorithm that monitors each of the systems that comprise my body and my brain could know exactly who I am, how I feel and what I want. Once developed, such an algorithm could replace the voter, the customer, and the beholder. Then the algorithm will know best, the algorithm will always be right, and beauty will be in the calculations of the algorithm. During the 19th and 20th centuries, the belief in individualism nevertheless made good practical sense, because there were no external algorithms that could actually monitor me effectively. States and markets may have wished to do exactly that, but they lacked the necessary technology. The KGB and FBI had only a vague understanding of my biochemistry, genome, and brain, and even if agents bugged every phone call I made and recorded every chance encounter on the street, they did not have the computing power to analyze all this data. Consequently, Given 20th century technological conditions, liberals were right to argue that nobody can know me better than I know myself. Humans therefore had a very good reason to regard themselves as an autonomous system, and to follow their own inner voices rather than the commands of Big Brother. However, 21st century technology may enable external algorithms to know me far better than I know myself, and once this happens, the belief in individualism will collapse and authority will shift from individual humans to networked algorithms. People will no longer see themselves as autonomous beings running their lives according to their wishes, and instead become accustomed to seeing themselves as a collection of biochemical mechanisms that is constantly monitored and guided by a network of electronic algorithms. For this to happen, there is no need of an external algorithm that knows me perfectly, and that never makes any mistakes, it is enough that an external algorithm will know me better than I know myself, and will make fewer mistakes than me. It will then make sense to trust this algorithm with more and more of my decisions and life choices. We have already crossed this line as far as medicine is concerned. In the hospital, we are no longer individuals. Who do you think will make the most momentous decisions about your body and your health during your lifetime? It is highly likely that many of these decisions will be taken by computer algorithms such as IBM's Watson. And this is not necessarily bad news. Diabetics already carry sensors that automatically check their sugar level several times a day, alerting them whenever it crosses a dangerous threshold. In 2014 researchers at Yale University announced the first successful trial of an artificial pancreas controlled by an iPhone. 52 diabetics took part in the experiment. Each patient had a tiny sensor and a tiny pump implanted in his or her stomach. The pump was connected to small tubes of insulin and glucagon, two hormones that together regulate sugar levels in the blood. The sensor constantly measured the sugar level, transmitting the data to an iPhone. The iPhone hosted an application that analyzed the information, and whenever necessary gave orders to the pump, which injected measured amounts of either insulin or glucagon, without any need of human intervention. Point 22. Many other people who suffer from no serious illnesses have begun to use wearable sensors and computers to monitor their health and activities. The devices, incorporated into anything from smartphones and wristwatches to armbands and underwear, record diverse biometric data such as blood pressure. The data is then fed into sophisticated computer programs, which advise you how to change your diet and daily routines so as to enjoy improved health and a longer and more productive life. Point 23 Google, together with the drug giant Novartis, are developing a contact lens that checks glucose levels in the blood every few seconds. By testing tear contents.24 Pixie Scientific sells smart diapers that analyze baby poop for clues about the baby's medical condition. Microsoft has launched the Microsoft Band in November 2014, a smart armband that monitors among other things your heartbeat, the quality of your sleep and the number of steps you take each day.
An application called Deadline goes a step further, telling you how many years of life you have left, given your current habits. Some people use these apps without thinking too deeply about it, but for others this is already an ideology, if not a religion. The quantified self movement argues that the self is nothing but mathematical patterns. These patterns are so complex that the human mind has no chance of understanding them. So if you wish to obey the old adage and know thyself, you should not waste your time on philosophy, meditation, or psychoanalysis, but rather you should systematically collect biometric data and allow algorithms to analyze them for you and tell you who you are and what you should do. The movement's motto is self-knowledge through numbers.25. In 2000 the Israeli singer Shlomi Shaven conquered the local playlists with his hit song Eric. It's about a guy who is obsessed with his girlfriend's ex, Eric. He demands to know who is better in bed. Him, or Eric. The girlfriend dodges the question, saying that it was different with each of them. The guy is not satisfied and demands, talk numbers, lady. Well, precisely for such guys, a company called Bedpost sells biometric armbands you can wear while having sex. The armband collects data such as heart rate, sweat level, duration of sexual intercourse, duration of orgasm and the number of calories you burnt. The data is fed into a computer that analyzes the information and ranks your performance with precise numbers. No more fake orgasms and, how was it for you, 26. People who experience themselves through the unrelenting mediation of such devices may begin to see themselves as a collection of biochemical systems more than as individuals, and their decisions will increasingly reflect the conflicting demands of the various systems. Point 27 Suppose you have two free hours a week, and you are unsure whether to use them in order to play chess or tennis. A good friend may ask, what does your heart tell you? Well, you answer, as far as my heart is concerned, it's obvious tennis is better. It's also better for my cholesterol level and blood pressure. But my fMRI scans indicate I should strengthen my left prefrontal cortex. In my family, dementia is quite common, and my uncle had it at a very early age. The latest studies indicate that a weekly game of chess can help delay the onset of dementia. You can already find much more extreme examples of external mediation in the geriatric wards of hospitals. Humanism fantasis is about old age as a period of wisdom and awareness. The ideal elder may suffer from bodily ailments and weaknesses, but his mind is quick and sharp, and he has 80 years of insights to dispense. He knows exactly what's what, and always has good advice for the grandchildren and other visitors. 21st century octogenarians don't always look like that. Thanks to our growing understanding of human biology, medicine keeps us alive long enough for our minds and our authentic selves to disintegrate and dissolve. All too often, What's left is a collection of dysfunctional biological systems kept going by a collection of monitors, computers and pumps. At a deeper level, as genetic technologies are integrated into daily life, and as people develop increasingly intimate relations with their DNA, the single self might blur even further, and the authentic inner voice might dissolve into a noisy crowd of genes. When I am faced by difficult dilemmas and decisions, I may stop searching for my inner voice, and instead consult my inner genetic parliament. On May 14, 2013 actress Angelina Jolie published an article in the New York Times about her decision to have a double mastectomy. Jolie lived for years under the shadow of breast cancer, as both her mother and grandmother died of it at a relatively early age. Jolie herself did a genetic test that proved she was carrying a dangerous mutation of the BRCA1 gene. According to recent statistical surveys, women carrying this mutation have an 87 percenter probability of developing breast cancer. Even though at the time Jolie did not have cancer, she decided to preempt the dreaded disease and have a double mastectomy. In the article Jolie explained that I choose not to keep my story private because there are many women who do not know that they might be living under the shadow of cancer. It is my hope that they, too, will be able to get gene tested, and that if they have a high risk, they, too, will know that they have strong options 28. Deciding whether to undergo a mastectomy is a difficult and potentially fatal choice. Beyond the discomforts, dangers and financial costs of the operation and its follow-up treatments, the decision can have far-reaching effects on one's health, body image, emotional well-being, and relationships. Jolie's choice, and the courage she showed in going public with it, caused a great stir and won her international acclaim and admiration. In particular, many hoped that the publicity would increase awareness of genetic medicine and its potential benefits. From a historical perspective, 
it is interesting to note the critical role algorithms played in this case. When Jolie had to take such an important decision about her life, she did not climb a mountaintop overlooking the ocean, watch the sunset into the waves and attempt to connect to her innermost feelings. Instead, she preferred to listen to her genes, whose voice manifested not in feelings but in numbers. Jolie felt no pain or discomfort whatsoever. Her feelings told her, relax, everything is perfectly fine. But the computer algorithms used by her doctors told a different story, you don't feel anything is wrong, but there is a time bomb ticking in your DNA. Do something about it, now. Of course, Jolie's emotions and unique personality played a key part too. If another woman with a different personality had discovered she was carrying the same genetic mutation, she might well have decided not to undergo a mastectomy. However, and here we enter the twilight zone, what if that other woman had discovered she carried not only the dangerous BRCA1 mutation, but another mutation in the, fictional, gene ABCD3, which impairs a brain area responsible for evaluating probabilities, thereby causing people to underestimate dangers? What if a statistician pointed out to this woman that her mother, grandmother, and several other relatives all died young because they underestimated various health risks and failed to take precautionary measures? In all likelihood, you too will make important decisions about your health in the same way as Angelina Jolie. You will do a genetic test, a blood test or an fMRI, an algorithm will analyze your results on the basis of enormous statistical databases, and you will then accept the algorithm's recommendation. This is not an apocalyptic scenario. The algorithms won't revolt and enslave us. Rather, the algorithms will be so good in making decisions for us that it would be madness not to follow their advice. Angelina Jolie's first leading role was in the 1993 science fiction action film Cyborg 2. She played Casella Reese, a cyborg developed in the year 2074 by Pinwheel Robotics for corporate espionage and assassination. Casella is programmed with human emotions, in order to blend better into human societies while pursuing her missions. When Casella discovers that Pinwheel Robotics not only controls her, but also intends to terminate her, she escapes and fights for her life and freedom. Cyborg 2 is a liberal fantasy about an individual fighting for liberty and privacy against global corporate octopuses. In her real life, Jolie preferred to sacrifice privacy and autonomy for health. A similar desire to improve human health may well cause most of us to willingly dismantle the barriers protecting our private spaces, and allow state bureaucracies and multinational corporations access to our innermost recesses. For instance, allowing Google to read our emails and follow our activities would make it possible for Google to alert us to brewing epidemics before they are noticed by traditional health services. How does the UK National Health Service know that a flu epidemic has erupted in London? by analyzing the reports of thousands of doctors in hundreds of clinics. And how do all these doctors get the information? Well, when Mary wakes up one morning feeling a bit under the weather, she doesn't run straight to her doctor. She waits a few hours, or even a day or two, hoping that a nice cup of tea with honey will do the trick. When things don't improve, she makes an appointment with the doctor, goes to the clinic and describes the symptoms. The doctor types the data into the computer, and somebody up in NHS headquarters hopefully analyzes this data together with reports streaming in from thousands of other doctors, concluding that flu is on the march. All this takes a lot of time. Google could do it in minutes. All it needs to do is monitor the words Londoners type in their emails and in Google's search engine, and cross-reference them with a database of disease symptoms. Suppose on an average day the words headache, fever, nausea, and sneezing appear 100,000 times in London emails and searches. If today the Google algorithm notices they appear 300,000 times, then bingo. We have a flu epidemic. There is no need to wait till Mary goes to her doctor. On the very first morning she woke up feeling a bit unwell, and before going to work she emailed a colleague, I have a headache, but I'll be there. That's all Google needs. However, for Google to work its magic, Mary must allow Google not only to read her messages, but also to share the information with the health authorities. If Angelina Jolie was willing to sacrifice her privacy in order to raise awareness of breast cancer, why shouldn't Mary make a similar sacrifice in order to fight epidemics? This isn't a theoretical idea. In 2008 Google actually launched Google Flu Trends, that tracks flu outbreaks by monitoring Google searches. The service is still being developed, and due to privacy limitations it tracks only search words and allegedly avoids reading private emails. 
but it is already capable of ringing the flu alarm bells 10 days before traditional health services. Point 29. A more ambitious project is called the Google Baseline Study. Google intends to build a mammoth database on human health, establishing the perfect health profile. This will hopefully make it possible to identify even the smallest deviations from the baseline, thereby alerting people to burgeoning health problems such as cancer when they can be nipped in the bud. The baseline study dovetails with an entire line of products called Google Fit. These products will be incorporated into wearables such as clothes, bracelets, shoes, and glasses, and will collect a never-ending stream of biometrical data. The idea is for Google Fit to feed the baseline study with the data it needs. Point 30. Yet companies such as Google want to go much deeper than wearables. The market for DNA testing is currently growing in leaps and bounds. One of its leaders is 23andMe, a private company. Founded by Ann Wojcicki, former wife of Google co-founder Sergey Brin. The name, 23andMe, refers to the 23 pairs of chromosomes that contain our genome, the message being that my chromosomes have a very special relationship with me. Anyone who can understand what the chromosomes are saying can tell you things about yourself that you never even suspected. If you want to know what, pay 23andMe a mere $99, and they will send you a small package with a tube. You spit into the tube, seal it and mail it to Mountain View, California. There the DNA in your saliva is read, and you receive the results online. You get a list of the potential health hazards you face, and your genetic predisposition for more than 90 traits and conditions ranging from baldness to blindness. Know thyself was never easier or cheaper. Since it is all based on statistics, the size of the company's database is the key to making accurate predictions. Hence the first company to build a giant genetic database will provide customers with the best predictions, and will potentially corner the market. U.S. biotech companies are increasingly worried that strict privacy laws in the USA combined with Chinese disregard for individual privacy may hand China the genetic market on a plate. If we connect all the dots, and if we give Google and its competitors free access to our biometric devices, to our DNA scans and to our medical records, we will get an all-knowing medical health service, which will not only fight epidemics, but will also shield us from cancer, heart attacks, and Alzheimer's. Yet with such a database at its disposal, Google could do far more. Imagine a system that, in the words of the famous police song, watches every breath you take, every move you make and every bond you break. A system that monitors your bank account and your heartbeat, your sugar levels and your sexual escapades. It will definitely know you much better than you know yourself. The self-deceptions and self-delusions that trap people in bad relationships, wrong careers, and harmful habits will not fool Google. Unlike the narrating self that controls us today, Google will not make decisions on the basis of cooked up stories, and will not be misled by cognitive shortcuts and the peak end rule. Google will actually remember every step we took and every hand we shook. Many people will be happy to transfer much of their decision making processes into the hands of such a system, or at least consult with it whenever they face important choices. Google will advise us which movie to see, where to go on holiday, what to study in college, which job offer to accept, and even whom to date and marry. Listen, Google, I will say, both John and Paul are courting me. I like both of them, but in a different way, and it's so hard to make up my mind. Given everything you know, what do you advise me to do? And Google will answer, well, I know you from the day you were born. I have read all your emails, recorded all your phone calls, and know your favorite films, your DNA, and the entire history of your heart. I have exact data about each date you went on, and if you want... I can show you second-by-second second graphs of your heart rate, blood pressure, and sugar levels whenever you went on a date with John or Paul. If necessary, I can even provide you with accurate mathematical ranking of every sexual encounter you had with either of them. And naturally enough, I know them as well as I know you. Based on all this information, on my superb algorithms, and on decades worth of statistics about millions of relationships, I advise you to go with John with an 87 percenter probability of being more satisfied with him in the long run. Indeed, I know you so well that I also know you don't like this answer. Paul is much more handsome than John, and because you give external appearances too much weight, you secretly wanted me to say Paul. Looks matter, of course, but not as much as you think. Your biochemical algorithms, which evolved tens of thousands of years ago in the African savanna, give looks a weight of 35 percenter in their overall rating of potential mates. My algorithms, which are based on 
The most up-to-date studies and statistics say that looks have only a 14 percent impact on the long-term success of romantic relationships. So, even though I took Paul's looks into account, I still tell you that you would be better off with John 31. In exchange for such devoted counseling services, we will just have to give up the idea that humans are individuals, and that each human has a free will determining what's good, what's beautiful, and what is the meaning of life. Humans will no longer be autonomous entities directed by the stories their narrating self invents. Instead, they will be integral parts of a huge global network. Liberalism sanctifies the narrating self, and allows it to vote in the polling stations, in the supermarket and in the marriage market. For centuries this made good sense, because though the narrating self believed in all kinds of fictions and fantasies, no alternative system knew me better. Yet once we have a system that really does know me better, it will be foolhardy to leave authority in the hands of the narrating self. Liberal habits such as democratic elections will become obsolete, because Google will be able to represent even my own political opinions better than myself. When I stand behind the curtain in the polling booth, liberalism instructs me to consult my authentic self, and choose whichever party or candidate reflects my deepest desires. Yet the life sciences point out that when I stand there behind the curtain, I don't really remember everything I felt and thought in the years since the last election. Moreover, I am bombarded by a barrage of propaganda, spin and random memories which might well distort my choices. Just as in Kahneman's cold water experiment, in politics too the narrating self follows the peak end rule. It forgets the vast majority of events, remembers only a few extreme incidents and gives a wholly disproportional weight to recent happenings. For four long years I may repeatedly complain about the PM's policies, telling myself and anyone willing to listen that he will be the ruin of us all. However, in the months prior to the elections the government cuts taxes and spends money generously. The ruling party hires the best copywriters to lead a brilliant campaign, with a well-balanced mixture of threats and promises that speak right to the fear center in my brain. On the morning of the elections I wake up with a cold, which impacts my mental processes, and causes me to prefer security and stability over all other considerations. And voila! I send the man who will be, the ruin of us all, back into office for another four years. I could have saved myself from such a fate if I only authorized Google to vote for me. Google wasn't born yesterday, you know. Though it doesn't ignore the recent tax cuts and the election promises, it also remembers what happened throughout the previous four years. It knows what my blood pressure was every time I read the morning newspapers, and how my dopamine level plummeted while I watched the evening news. Google will know how to screen the spin doctor's empty slogans. Google will also know that illness makes voters lean a bit more to the right than usual, and will compensate for this. Google will therefore be able to vote not according to my momentary state of mind, and not according to the fantasies of the narrating self, but rather according to the real feelings and interests of the collection of biochemical algorithms known as I. Naturally, Google will not always get it right. After all, these are all just probabilities. But if Google makes enough good decisions, people will grant it increasing authority. As time goes by, the databases will grow, the statistics will become more accurate, the algorithms will improve and the decisions will be even better. The system will never know me perfectly, and will never be infallible. But there is no need for that. Liberalism will collapse on the day the system knows me better than I know myself. Which is less difficult than it may sound, given that most people don't really know themselves well. A recent study commissioned by Google's nemesis, Facebook, has indicated that already today the Facebook algorithm is a better judge of human personalities and dispositions even than people's friends, parents, and spouses. The study was conducted on 86,220 volunteers who have a Facebook account and who completed a 100-item personality questionnaire. The Facebook algorithm predicted the volunteers' answers based on monitoring their Facebook likes, which web pages, images, and clips they tagged with the like button. The more likes, the more accurate the predictions. The algorithm's predictions were compared with those of work colleagues, friends, family members, and spouses. Amazingly, the algorithm needed a set of only 10 likes in order to outperform the predictions of work colleagues. It needed 70 likes to outperform friends, 150 likes to outperform family members and 300 likes to outperform spouses. In other words, if you happen to have clicked 300 likes on your Facebook account, the Facebook algorithm can predict your opinions and desires better than your husband or wife. Indeed, in some fields the Facebook algorithm did better than the person themselves.
participants were asked to evaluate things such as their level of substance use or the size of their social networks. Their judgments were less accurate than those of the algorithm. The research concludes with the following prediction, made by the human authors of the article, not by the Facebook algorithm people might abandon their own psychological judgments and rely on computers when making important life decisions, such as choosing activities, career paths, or even romantic partners. It is possible that such data-driven decisions will improve people's lives 32. On a more sinister note, the same study implies that in the next U.S. presidential elections, Facebook could know not only the political opinions of tens of millions of Americans, but also who among them are the critical swing votes, and how these votes might be swung. Facebook could tell you that in Oklahoma the race between Republicans and Democrats is particularly close, Facebook could identify the 32,417 voters who still haven't made up their mind, and Facebook could determine what each candidate needs to say in order to tip the balance. How could Facebook obtain this priceless political data? We provide it for free. In the high days of European imperialism, conquistadors and merchants bought entire islands and countries in exchange for colored beads. In the 21st century our personal data is probably the most valuable resource most humans still have to offer and we are giving it to the tech giants in exchange for email services and funny cat videos. From Oracle to Sovereign Once Google, Facebook, and other algorithms become all-knowing oracles, they may well evolve into agents and finally into sovereigns.33 To understand this trajectory, consider the case of Waze, a GPS-based navigational application which many drivers use nowadays. Waze isn't just a map. It's millions of users constantly updated about traffic jams, car accidents and police cars. Hence Waze knows to divert you away from heavy traffic and bring you to your destination through the quickest possible route. When you reach a junction and your gut instinct tells you to turn right, but Waze instructs you to turn left, users sooner or later learn that they had better listen to Waze rather than to their feelings.34. At first sight it seems that the Waze algorithm serves us only as an oracle. We ask a question, the oracle replies, but it is up to us to make a decision. If the oracle wins our trust, however, the next logical step is to turn it into an agent. We give the algorithm only a final aim, and it acts to realize that aim without our supervision. In the case of Waze, this may happen when we connect Waze to a self-driving car, and tell Waze, take the fastest route home, or take the most scenic route, or take the route which will result in the minimum amount of pollution. We call the shots, but leave it to Waze to execute our commands. Finally, Waze might become sovereign. Having so much power in its hands, and knowing far more than we know, it may start manipulating us, shaping our desires and making our decisions for us. For example, suppose because Waze is so good, everybody starts using it. And suppose there is a traffic jam on route number 1, while the alternative route number 2 is relatively open. If Waze simply lets everybody know that, then all drivers will rush to route number 2, and it too will be clogged. When everybody uses the same oracle, and everybody believes the oracle, the oracle turns into a sovereign. So Waze must think for us. Maybe it will inform only half the drivers that route number 2 is open, while keeping this information secret from the other half. Thereby pressure will ease on route number 1 without blocking route number 2. Microsoft is developing a far more sophisticated system called Cortana, named after an AI character in their popular Halo video game series. Cortana is an AI personal assistant which Microsoft hopes to include as an integral feature of future versions of Windows. Users will be encouraged to allow Cortana access to all their files, emails, and applications, so that it will get to know them, and can offer its advice on myriad matters, as well as becoming a virtual agent representing the user's interests. Cortana could remind you to buy something for your wife's birthday, select the present, reserve a table at the restaurant and prompt you to take your medicine an hour before dinner. It could alert you that if you don't stop reading now, you will be late for an important business meeting. As you are about to enter the meeting, Cortana will warn that your blood pressure is too high and your dopamine level too low, and based on past statistics, you tend to make serious business mistakes in such circumstances. So you had better keep things tentative and avoid committing yourself or signing any deals. Once Cortanas evolve from oracles to agents, they might start speaking directly with one another, on their master's behalf. It can begin innocently enough, with my Cortana contacting your Cortana to agree on a place and time for a meeting. Next thing I know, a potential employer tells me not to bother sending a CV, 
but simply allow his Cortana to grill my Cortana. Or my Cortana may be approached by the Cortana of a potential lover, and the two will compare notes to decide whether it's a good match, completely unbeknown to their human owners. As Cortanas gain authority, they may begin manipulating each other to further the interests of their masters, so that success in the job market or the marriage market may increasingly depend on the quality of your Cortana. Rich people owning the most up-to-date Cortana will have a decisive advantage over poor people with their older versions. But the murkiest issue of all concerns the identity of Cortana's master. As we have seen, humans are not individuals, and they don't have a single unified self. Whose interests, then, should Cortana serve? Suppose my narrating self makes a New Year resolution to start a diet and go to the gym every day. A week later, when it is time to go to the gym, the experiencing self asks Cortana to turn on the TV and order pizza. What should Cortana do? Should it obey the experiencing self, or the resolution taken a week ago by the narrating self? You may well ask whether Cortana is really different from an alarm clock, which the narrating self sets in the evening, in order to wake the experiencing self in time for work. But Cortana will have far more power over me than an alarm clock. The experiencing self can silence the alarm clock by pressing a button. In contrast, Cortana will know me so well that it will know exactly what inner buttons to push in order to make me follow its advice. Microsoft's Cortana is not alone in this game. Google Now and Apple's Siri are headed in the same direction. Amazon too has algorithms that constantly study you and use their knowledge to recommend products. When I go to Amazon to buy a book, an ad pops up and tells me, I know which books you liked in the past. People with similar tastes also tend to love this or that new book. Wonderful. There are millions of books in the world, and I can never go over all of them, not to mention predicting accurately which ones I would like. How good that an algorithm knows me, and can give me recommendations based on my unique taste. And this is just the beginning. Today in the US more people read digital books than printed volumes. Devices such as Amazon's Kindle are able to collect data on their users while they are reading the book. For example, your Kindle can monitor which parts of the book you read fast, and which slow, on which page you took a break, and on which sentence you abandoned the book, never to pick it up again. Better tell the author to rewrite that bit. If Kindle is upgraded with face recognition and biometric sensors, it can know what made you laugh, what made you sad and what made you angry. Soon, books will read you while you are reading them. And whereas you quickly forget most of what you read, Amazon will never forget a thing. Such data will enable Amazon to evaluate the suitability of a book much better than ever before. It will also enable Amazon to know exactly who you are, and how to turn you on and off.35. Eventually, we may reach a point when it will be impossible to disconnect from this all-knowing network even for a moment. Disconnection will mean death. If medical hopes are realized, future people will incorporate into their bodies a host of biometric devices, bionic organs, and nanorobots, which will monitor our health and defend us from infections, illnesses, and damage. Yet these devices will have to be online 24-7, both in order to be updated with the latest medical news, and in order to protect them from the new plagues of cyberspace. Just as my home computer is constantly attacked by viruses, worms, and Trojan horses, so will be my pacemaker, my hearing aid and my nanotech immune system. If I don't update my body's antivirus program regularly, I will wake up one day to discover that the millions of nanorobots coursing through my veins are now controlled by a North Korean hacker. The new technologies of the 21st century may thus reverse the humanist revolution, stripping humans of their authority, and empowering non-human algorithms instead. If you are horrified by this direction, don't blame the computer geeks. The responsibility actually lies with the biologists. It is crucial to realize that this entire trend is fueled by biological insights more than by computer science. It is the life sciences that have concluded that organisms are algorithms. If this is not the case, if organisms function in an inherently different way to algorithms, then computers may work wonders in other fields, but they will not be able to understand us and direct our life, and they will certainly be incapable of merging with us. Yet once biologists concluded that organisms are algorithms, they dismantled the wall between the organic and inorganic, turned the computer revolution from a purely mechanical affair into a biological cataclysm, and shifted authority from individual humans to networked algorithms. Some people are indeed horrified by this development, but the fact is that millions willingly embrace it. Already today many of us give up our privacy and our individuality, record our every action, 
conduct our lives online and become hysterical if connection to the net is interrupted even for a few minutes. The shifting of authority from humans to algorithms is happening all around us, not as a result of some momentous governmental decision, but due to a flood of mundane choices. The result will not be an Orwellian police state. We always prepare ourselves for the previous enemy, even when we face an altogether new menace. Defenders of human individuality stand guard against the tyranny of the collective, without realizing that human individuality is now threatened from the opposite direction. The individual will not be crushed by Big Brother, it will disintegrate from within. Today corporations and governments pay homage to my individuality, and promise to provide medicine, education, and entertainment customized to my unique needs and wishes. But in order to sow, Corporations and governments first need to break me up into biochemical subsystems, monitor these subsystems with ubiquitous sensors and decipher their working with powerful algorithms. In the process, the individual will transpire to be nothing but a religious fantasy. Reality will be a mesh of biochemical and electronic algorithms, without clear borders, and without individual hubs. Upgrading inequality. So far we have looked at two of the three practical threats to liberalism, firstly, that humans will lose their value completely, secondly, that humans will still be valuable collectively, but they will lose their individual authority, and will instead be managed by external algorithms. The system will still need you to compose symphonies, teach history, or write computer code, but the system will know you better than you know yourself, and will therefore make most of the important decisions for you, and you will be perfectly happy with that. It won't necessarily be a bad world, it will, however, be a post-liberal world. The third threat to liberalism is that some people will remain both indispensable and undecipherable, but they will constitute a small and privileged elite of upgraded humans. These superhumans will enjoy unheard of abilities and unprecedented creativity, which will allow them to go on making many of the most important decisions in the world. They will perform crucial services for the system, while the system could not understand and manage them. However, most humans will not be upgraded, and they will consequently become an inferior caste dominated by both computer algorithms and the new superhumans. Splitting humankind into biological castes will destroy the foundations of liberal ideology. Liberalism can coexist with socio-economic gaps. Indeed, since it favors liberty over equality, it takes such gaps for granted. However, liberalism still presupposes that all human beings have equal value and authority. From a liberal perspective, it is perfectly all right that one person is a billionaire living in a sumptuous chateau, whereas another is a poor peasant living in a straw hut. For according to liberalism, the peasant's unique experiences are still just as valuable as the billionaire's. That's why liberal authors write long novels about the experiences of poor peasants, and why even billionaires read such books avidly. If you go to see Les Miserables in Broadway or Covent Garden, you will find that good seats can cost hundreds of dollars, and the audience's combined wealth probably runs into the billions, yet they still sympathize with Jean Valjean who served 19 years in jail for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his starving nephews. The same logic operates on election day, when the vote of the poor peasant counts for exactly the same as the billionaires. The liberal solution for social inequality is to give equal value to different human experiences, instead of trying to create the same experiences for everyone. However, what will be the fate of this solution once rich and poor are separated not merely by wealth, but also by real biological gaps. In her New York Times article, Angelina Jolie referred to the high costs of genetic testing. At present, the test Jolie had taken costs $3,000, which does not include the price of the actual mastectomy, the reconstruction surgery and related treatments. This in a world where 1 billion people earn less than $1 per day, and another 1.5 billion earn between $1 and $2 a day.36 even if they work hard their entire life, they will never be able to finance a $3,000 genetic test. And the economic gaps are at present only increasing. As of early 2016, the 62 richest people in the world were worth as much as the poorest 3.6 billion people. Since the world's population is about 7.2 billion, it means that these 62 billionaires together hold as much wealth as the entire bottom half of humankind.37. The cost of DNA testing is likely to go down with time but expensive new procedures are constantly being pioneered. So while old treatments will gradually come within reach of the masses, the elites will always remain a couple of steps ahead. Throughout history the rich enjoyed many social and political advantages, 
but there was never a huge biological gap separating them from the poor. Medieval aristocrats claimed that superior blue blood was flowing through their veins, and Hindu Brahmins insisted that they were naturally smarter than everyone else, but this was pure fiction. In the future, however, we may see real gaps in physical and cognitive abilities opening between an upgraded upper class and the rest of society. When scientists are confronted with this scenario, their standard reply is that in the 20th century too many medical breakthroughs began with the rich, but eventually benefited the whole population and helped to narrow rather than widen the social gaps. For example, vaccines and antibiotics at first profited mainly the upper classes in Western countries, but today they improve the lives of all humans everywhere. However, the expectation that this process will be repeated in the 21st century may be just wishful thinking, for two important reasons. First, medicine is undergoing a tremendous conceptual revolution. 20th century medicine aimed to heal the sick. 21st century medicine is increasingly aiming to upgrade the healthy. Healing the sick was an egalitarian project, because it assumed that there is a normative standard of physical and mental health that everyone can and should enjoy. If someone fell below the norm, it was the job of doctors to fix the problem and help him or her be like everyone. In contrast, upgrading the healthy is an elitist project, because it rejects the idea of a universal standard applicable to all, and seeks to give some individuals an edge over others. People want superior memories, above average intelligence, and first class sexual abilities. If some form of upgrade becomes so cheap and common that everyone enjoys it, it will simply be considered the new baseline, which the next generation of treatments will strive to surpass. Second, 20th century medicine benefited the masses because the 20th century was the age of the masses. 20th century armies needed millions of healthy soldiers, and the economy needed millions of healthy workers. Consequently, states established public health services to ensure the health and vigor of everyone. Our greatest medical achievements were the provision of mass hygiene facilities, the campaigns of mass vaccinations and the overcoming of mass epidemics. The Japanese elite in 1914 had a vested interest in vaccinating the poor and building hospitals and sewage systems in the slums, because if they wanted Japan to be a strong nation with a strong army and a strong economy, they needed many millions of healthy soldiers and workers. But the age of the masses may be over, and with it the age of mass medicine. As human soldiers and workers give way to algorithms, at least some elites may conclude that there is no point in providing improved or even standard conditions of health for masses of useless poor people, and it is far more sensible to focus on upgrading a handful of superhumans beyond the norm. Already today, the birth rate is falling in technologically advanced countries such as Japan and South Korea, where prodigious efforts are invested in the upbringing and education of fewer and fewer children, from whom more and more is expected. How could huge developing countries like India, Brazil, or Nigeria hope to compete with Japan? These countries resemble a long train. The elites in the first-class carriages enjoy health care, education, and income levels on a PAR with the most developed nations in the world. However, the hundreds of millions of ordinary citizens who crowd the third-class carriages still suffer from widespread diseases, ignorance, and poverty. What would the Indian, Brazilian, or Nigerian elites prefer to do in the coming century? Invest in fixing the problems of hundreds of millions of poor, or in upgrading a few million rich. Unlike in the 20th century, when the elite had a stake in fixing the problems of the poor because they were militarily and economically vital, in the 21st century the most efficient, albeit ruthless, strategy may be to let go of the useless third-class carriages, and dash forward with the first class only. In order to compete with Japan, Brazil might need a handful of upgraded superhumans far more than millions of healthy ordinary workers. How can liberal beliefs survive the appearance of superhumans with exceptional physical, emotional, and intellectual abilities? What will happen if it turns out that such superhumans have fundamentally different experiences to normal sapiens? What if superhumans are bored by novels about the experiences of lowly sapiens thieves, whereas run-of-the-mill humans find soap operas about superhuman love affairs unintelligible? The great human projects of the 20th century, overcoming famine, plague and war, aimed to safeguard a universal norm of abundance, health, and peace for all people without exception. The new projects of the 21st century, gaining immortality, bliss, and divinity, also hope to serve the whole of humankind. However, because these projects aim at surpassing rather than safeguarding the norm, 
they may well result in the creation of a new superhuman caste that will abandon its liberal roots and treat normal humans no better than 19th century Europeans treated Africans. If scientific discoveries and technological developments split humankind into a mass of useless humans and a small elite of upgraded superhumans, or if authority shifts altogether away from human beings into the hands of highly intelligent algorithms, then liberalism will collapse. What new religions or ideologies might fill the resulting vacuum and guide the subsequent evolution of our godlike descendants? Chapter 10. The Ocean of Consciousness. The new religions are unlikely to emerge from the caves of Afghanistan or from the madrasas of the Middle East. Rather, they will emerge from research laboratories. Just as socialism took over the world by promising salvation through steam and electricity, so in the coming decades new techno-religions may conquer the world by promising salvation through algorithms and genes. Despite all the talk of radical Islam and Christian fundamentalism, the most interesting place in the world from a religious perspective is not the Islamic State or the Bible Belt, but Silicon Valley. That's where high-tech gurus are brewing for us brave new religions that have little to do with God, and everything to do with technology. They promise all the old prizes, happiness, peace, prosperity, and even eternal life, but here on earth with the help of technology, rather than after death with the help of celestial beings. These new techno-religions can be divided into two main types, techno-humanism and data religion. Data religion argues that humans have completed their cosmic task, and they should now pass the torch on to entirely new kinds of entities. We will discuss the dreams and nightmares of data religion in the next chapter. This chapter is dedicated to the more conservative creed of techno-humanism, which still sees humans as the apex of creation and clings to many traditional humanist values. Techno-humanism agrees that Homo sapiens as we know it has run its historical course and will no longer be relevant in the future, but concludes that we should therefore use technology in order to create Homo Deus, a much superior human model. Homo Deus will retain some essential human features, but will also enjoy upgraded physical and mental abilities that will enable it to hold its own even against the most sophisticated non-conscious algorithms. Since intelligence is decoupling from consciousness, and since non-conscious intelligence is developing at breakneck speed, humans must actively upgrade their minds if they want to stay in the game. 70,000 years ago the cognitive revolution transformed the sapiens mind, thereby turning an insignificant African ape into the ruler of the world. The improved sapiens minds suddenly had access to the vast intersubjective realm, which enabled us to create gods and corporations, to build cities and empires, to invent writing and money, and eventually to split the atom and reach the moon. As far as we know, this earth-shattering revolution resulted from a few small changes in the sapiens DNA, and a slight rewiring of the sapiens brain. If so, says techno-humanism, maybe a few additional changes to our genome and another rewiring of our brain will suffice for launching a second cognitive revolution. The mental renovations of the first cognitive revolution gave Homo sapiens access to the intersubjective realm and turned us into the rulers of the planet, a second cognitive revolution might give Homo Deus access to unimaginable new realms and turn us into the lords of the galaxy. This idea is an updated variant on the old dreams of evolutionary humanism, which already a century ago called for the creation of superhumans. However, whereas Hitler and his ilk planned to create superhumans by means of selective breeding and ethnic cleansing, 21st century techno. Humanism hopes to reach the goal far more peacefully, with the help of genetic engineering, nanotechnology, and brain, computer interfaces. Gap the mind. Techno-humanism seeks to upgrade the human mind and give us access to unknown experiences and unfamiliar states of consciousness. However, revamping the human mind is an extremely complex and dangerous undertaking. As we saw in Chapter 3, we don't really understand the mind. We don't know how minds emerge, or what their function is. Through trial and error we learn how to engineer mental states, but we seldom comprehend the full implications of such manipulations. Worse yet, since we are unfamiliar with the full spectrum of mental states, we don't know what mental aims to set ourselves. We are akin to the inhabitants of a small isolated island who have just invented the first boat, and are about to set sail without a map or even a destination. Indeed, we are in a somewhat worse condition. The inhabitants of our imaginary island at least know that they occupy just a small space within a large and mysterious sea. We fail to appreciate that we are living on a tiny island of consciousness within a giant ocean of alien mental states. Just as the spectrums of light and sound are far larger than what we humans can see and hear, so the spectrum of mental states is far larger than what the average human is aware of. 
we can see light in wavelengths of between 400 and 700 nanometers only. Above this small principality of human vision extend the unseen but vast realms of infrared, microwaves and radio waves, and below it lie the dark kingdoms of ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. Similarly, the spectrum of possible mental states may be infinite, but science has studied only two tiny sections of it, the subnormative and the weird. For more than a century psychologists and biologists have conducted extensive research on people suffering from various psychiatric disorders and mental diseases. Consequently, today we have a very detailed, though far from perfect, map of the subnormative mental spectrum. Simultaneously, scientists have studied the mental states of people considered to be healthy and normative. However, most scientific research about the human mind and the human experience has been conducted on people from Western, educated, industrial East, rich and democratic, weird, societies, who do not constitute a representative sample of humanity. The study of the human mind has so far assumed that Homo sapiens is Homer Simpson. In a groundbreaking 2010 study, Joseph Henrik, Stephen J. Heine and Aaron Oranzayan systematically surveyed all the papers published between 2003 and 2007 in leading scientific journals belonging to six different subfields of psychology. The study found that though the papers often make broad claims about the human mind, most of them base their findings on exclusively weird samples. For example, in papers published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, arguably the most important journal in the subfield of social psychology, 96% of the sampled individuals were weird, and 68% were Americans. Moreover, 67% of American subjects and 80% of non-American subjects were psychology students. In other words, more than two-thirds of the individuals sampled for papers published in this prestigious journal were psychology students in Western universities. Henrik, Heine, and Noren Zayen half-jokingly suggested that the journal change its name to the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology of American Psychology Students. Humans can see only a minuscule part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The spectrum in its entirety is about 10 trillion times larger than that of visible light. Might the mental spectrum be equally vast? Psychology students star in many of the studies because their professors oblige them to take part in experiments. If I am a psychology professor at Harvard it is much easier for me to conduct experiments on my own students than on the residents of a crime-ridden New York slum not to mention traveling to Namibia and conducting experiments on hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert. However, it may well be that New York slum dwellers and Kalahari hunter-gatherers experience mental states which we will never discover by forcing Harvard psychology students to answer long questionnaires or stick their heads into fMRI scanners. Even if we travel all over the globe and study each and every community, we would still cover only a limited part of the sapiens' mental spectrum. Nowadays, all humans have been touched by modernity, and we are all members of a single global village. Though Kalahari foragers are somewhat less modern than Harvard psychology students, they are not a time capsule from our distant past. They too have been influenced by Christian missionaries, European traders, wealthy ecotourists and inquisitive anthropologists, the joke is that in the Kalahari desert, the typical hunter-gatherer band consists of 20 hunters, 20 gatherers, and 50 anthropologists. Before the emergence of the global village, the planet was a galaxy of isolated human cultures, which might have fostered mental states that are now extinct. Different socio-economic realities and daily routines nurtured different states of consciousness. Who could gauge the minds of Stone Age mammoth hunters, Neolithic farmers, or Kamakura samurais? Moreover, many pre-modern cultures believed in the existence of superior states of consciousness, which people might access using meditation, drugs, or rituals. Shamans, monks, and ascetics systematically explored the mysterious lands of mind, and came back laden with breathtaking stories. They told of unfamiliar states of supreme tranquility, extreme sharpness, and matchless sensitivity. They told of the mind expanding to infinity or dissolving into emptiness. The humanist revolution caused modern Western culture to lose faith and interest in superior mental states, and to sanctify the mundane experiences of the average Joe. Modern Western culture is therefore unique in lacking a special class of people who seek to experience extraordinary mental states. It believes anyone attempting to do so is a drug addict, mental patient, or charlatan. Consequently, though we have a detailed map of the mental landscape of Harvard psychology students, we know far less about the mental landscapes of Native American shamans, Buddhist monks, 
or Sufi mystics point to. And that is just the sapiens mind. 50,000 years ago, we shared this planet with our Neanderthal cousins. They didn't launch spaceships, build pyramids or establish empires. They obviously had very different mental abilities, and lacked many of our talents. Nevertheless, they had bigger brains than us sapiens. What exactly did they do with all those neurons? We have absolutely no idea. But they might well have had many mental states that no sapiens had ever experienced. Yet even if we take into account all human species that ever existed, that would still not exhaust the mental spectrum. Other animals probably have experiences that we humans can barely imagine. Bats, for example, experience the world through echolocation. They emit a very rapid stream of high-frequency calls, well beyond the range of the human ear. They then detect and interpret the returning echoes to build a picture of the world. That picture is so detailed and accurate that the bats can fly quickly between trees and buildings, chase and capture moths and mosquitoes, and all the time evade owls and other predators. The bats live in a world of echoes. Just as in the human world every object has a characteristic shape and color, so in the bat world every object has its echo pattern. A bat can tell the difference between a tasty moth species and a poisonous moth species by the different echoes returning from their slender wings. Some edible moth species try to protect themselves by evolving an echo pattern similar to that of a poisonous species. Other moths have evolved an even more remarkable ability to deflect the waves of the bat radar, so that like stealth bombers they fly around without the bat knowing they are there. The world of echolocation is as complex and stormy as our familiar world of sound and sight, but we are completely oblivious to it. One of the most important articles about the philosophy of mind is titled, What is it like to be a bat? 3 In this 1974 article, the philosopher Thomas Nagel points out that a sapien's mind cannot fathom the subjective world of a bat. We can write all the algorithms we want about the bat body, about bat echolocation systems and about bat neurons, but it won't tell us how it feels to be a bat. How does it feel to echolocate a moth flapping its wings? Is it similar to seeing it, or is it something completely different? Trying to explain to a sapiens how it feels to echolocate a butterfly is probably as pointless as explaining to a blind mole how it feels to see a Caravaggio. It's likely that bat emotions are also deeply influenced by the centrality of their echolocation sense. For sapiens, love is red, envy is green and depression is blue. Who knows what echolocations color the love of a female bat to her offspring, or the feelings of a male bat towards his rivals. Bats aren't special, of course. They are but one out of countless possible examples. Just as sapiens cannot understand what it's like to be a bat, we have similar difficulties understanding how it feels to be a whale, a tiger, or a pelican. It certainly feels like something, but we don't know like what. Both whales and humans process emotions in a part of the brain called the limbic system, yet the whale limbic system contains an entire additional part which is missing from the human structure. Maybe that part enables whales to experience extremely deep and complex emotions which are alien to us. Whales might also have astounding musical experiences which even Bach and Mozart couldn't grasp. Whales can hear one another from hundreds of kilometers away, and each whale has a repertoire of characteristic songs that may last for hours and follow very intricate patterns. Every now and then a whale composes a new hit, which other whales throughout the ocean adopt. Scientists routinely record these hits and analyze them with the help of computers, but can any human fathom these? Musical experiences and tell the difference between a whale Beethoven and a whale Justin Bieber, 4. None of this should surprise us. Sapiens don't rule the world because they have deeper emotions or more complex musical experiences than other animals. So we may be inferior to whales, bats, tigers and pelicans at least in some emotional and experiential domains. Beyond the mental spectrum of humans, bats, whales and all other animals, even vaster and stranger continents may lie in wait. In all probability, there is an infinite variety of mental states that no sapiens, bat or dinosaur ever experienced in 4 billion years of terrestrial evolution, because they did not have the necessary faculties. In the future, however, powerful drugs, genetic engineering, electronic helmets and direct brain, computer interfaces may open passages to these places. Just as Columbus and Magellan sailed beyond the horizon to explore new islands and unknown continents, so we may one day set sail towards the antipodes of the mind. I smell fear. As long as doctors, engineers, and customers focused on healing mental diseases and enjoying life in weird societies, the study of subnormal mental states and weird minds was perhaps sufficient to our needs. 
Though normative psychology is often accused of mistreating any divergence from the norm, in the last century it has brought relief to countless people, saving the lives and sanity of millions. However, at the beginning of the third millennium we face a completely different kind of challenge. As liberal humanism makes way for techno-humanism, and medicine is increasingly focused on upgrading the healthy rather than healing the sick. Doctors, engineers, and customers no longer want merely to fix mental problems, they seek to upgrade the mind. We are acquiring the technical abilities to begin manufacturing new states of consciousness, yet we lack a map of these potential new territories. Since we are familiar mainly with the normative and subnormative mental spectrum of weird people, we don't even know what destinations to aim towards. Not surprisingly, then, positive psychology has become the trendiest subfield of the discipline. In the 1990s leading experts such as Martin Seligman, Ed Dinner, and Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi I argued that psychology should study not just mental illnesses, but also mental strengths. How come we have a remarkably detailed atlas of the sick mind, but have no scientific map of the prosperous mind? Over the last two decades, positive psychology has made important first steps in the study of supernormative mental states, but as of 2016, the supernormative zone is largely terra incognita to science. Under such circumstances, we might rush forward without any map, and focus on upgrading those mental abilities that the current economic and political system needs, while neglecting and even downgrading other abilities. Of course, this is not a completely new phenomenon. For thousands of years the system has been shaping and reshaping our minds according to its needs. Sapiens originally evolved as members of small intimate communities, and their mental faculties were not adapted to living as cogs within a giant machine. However, with the rise of cities, kingdoms, and empires, the system cultivated capacities required for large-scale cooperation, while disregarding other skills and talents. For example, archaic humans probably made extensive use of their sense of smell. Hunter-gatherers are able to smell from a distance the difference between various animal species, various humans, and even various emotions. Fear, for example, smells different to courage. When a man is afraid he secretes different chemicals compared to when he is full of courage. If you sat among an archaic band debating whether to start a war against a neighboring band, you could literally smell public opinion. As sapiens organized themselves in larger groups, our nose lost its importance, because it is useful only when dealing with small numbers of individuals. You cannot, for example, smell the American fear of China. Consequently, human olfactory powers were neglected. Brain areas that tens of thousands of years ago probably dealt with odors were put to work on more urgent tasks such as reading, mathematics, and abstract reasoning. The system prefers that our neurons solve differential equations rather than smell our neighbors.5. The same thing happened to our other senses, and to the underlying ability to pay attention to our sensations. Ancient foragers were always sharp and attentive. Wandering in the forest in search of mushrooms, they sniffed the wind carefully and watched the ground intently. When they found a mushroom, they ate it with the utmost attention, aware of every little nuance of flavor, which could distinguish an edible mushroom from its poisonous cousin. Members of today's affluent societies don't need such keen awareness. We can go to the supermarket and buy any of a thousand different dishes, all supervised by the health authorities. But whatever we choose, Italian pizza or Thai noodles, we are likely to eat it in haste in front of the TV, hardly paying attention to the taste, which is why food producers are constantly inventing new exciting flavors, which might somehow pierce the curtain of indifference. Similarly, when going on holiday we can choose between thousands of amazing destinations. But wherever we go, we are likely to be playing with our smartphone instead of really seeing the place. We have more choice than ever before, but no matter what we choose, we have lost the ability to really pay attention to it. Point six. In addition to smelling and paying attention, we have also been losing our ability to dream. Many cultures believed that what people see and do in their dreams is no less important than what they see and do while awake. Hence people actively developed their ability to dream, to remember dreams and even to control their actions in the dream world, which is known as lucid dreaming. Experts in lucid dreaming could move about the dream world at will, and claimed they could even travel to higher planes of existence or meet visitors from other worlds. The modern world, in contrast, dismisses dreams as subconscious messages at best, and mental garbage at worst. Consequently, dreams play a much smaller part in our lives, few people actively develop their dreaming skills, and 
Many people claim that they don't dream at all, or that they cannot remember any of their dreams. Point seven did the decline in our capacity to smell, to pay attention and to dream make our lives poorer and grayer? Maybe. But even if it did, for the economic and political system it was worth it. Mathematical skills are more important to the economy than smelling flowers or dreaming about fairies. For similar reasons, it is likely that future upgrades to the human mind will reflect political needs and market forces. For example, the U.S. Army's attention helmet is meant to help people focus on well-defined tasks and speed up their decision-making process. It may, however, reduce their ability to show empathy and tolerate doubts and inner conflicts. Humanist psychologists have pointed out that people in distress often don't want a quick fix, they want somebody to listen to them and sympathize with their fears and misgivings. Suppose you are having an ongoing crisis in your workplace, because your new boss doesn't appreciate your views, and insists on doing everything her way. After one particularly unhappy day, you pick up the phone and call a friend. But the friend has little time and energy for you, so he cuts you short, and tries to solve your problem, okay. I get it. Well, you really have just two options here, either quit the job, or stay and do what the boss wants. And if I were you, I would quit. That would hardly help. A really good friend will have patience, and will not be quick to find a solution. He will listen to your distress, and will provide time and space for all your contradictory emotions and gnawing anxieties to surface. The attention helmet works a bit like the impatient friend. Of course sometimes, on the battlefield, for instance, people need to take firm decisions quickly. But there is more to life than that. If we start using the attention helmet in more and more situations, we may end up losing our ability to tolerate confusion, doubts, and contradictions, just as we have lost our ability to smell, dream and pay attention. The system may push us in that direction, because it usually rewards us for the decisions we make rather than for our doubts. Yet a life of resolute decisions and quick fixes may be poorer and shallower than one of doubts and contradictions. When you mix a practical ability to engineer minds with our ignorance of the mental spectrum and with the narrow interests of governments, armies, and corporations, you get a recipe for trouble. We may successfully upgrade our bodies and our brains, while losing our minds in the process. Indeed, techno-humanism may end up downgrading humans. The system may prefer downgraded humans not because they would possess any superhuman knacks, but because they would lack some really disturbing human qualities that hamper the system and slow it down. As any farmer knows, it's usually the brightest goat in the herd that stirs up the greatest trouble, which is why the agricultural revolution involved downgrading animal mental abilities. The second cognitive revolution dreamed up by techno-humanists might do the same to us. The nail on which the universe hangs. Techno-humanism faces another dire threat. Like all humanist sects, techno-humanism too sanctifies the human will, seeing it as the nail on which the entire universe hangs. Techno-humanism expects our desires to choose which mental abilities to develop, and to thereby determine the shape of future minds. Yet what would happen once technological progress makes it possible to reshape and engineer our desires themselves? Humanism always emphasized that it is not easy to identify our authentic will. When we try to listen to ourselves, we are often flooded by a cacophony of conflicting noises. Indeed, we sometimes don't really want to hear our authentic voice, because it can disclose unwelcome secrets and make uncomfortable requests. Many people take great care not to probe themselves too deeply. A successful lawyer on the fast track may stifle an inner voice telling her to take a break and have a child. A woman trapped in a dissatisfying marriage fears losing the security it provides. A guilt-ridden soldier is stalked by nightmares about atrocities he committed. A young man unsure of his sexuality follows a personal, don't ask, don't tell, policy. Humanism doesn't think any of these situations has an obvious one-size-fits-all solution. But humanism demands that we show some guts, listen to the inner messages even if they scare us, identify our authentic voice and then follow its instructions regardless of the difficulties. Technological progress has a very different agenda. It doesn't want to listen to our inner voices. It wants to control them. Once we understand the biochemical system producing all these voices, we can play with the switches, Turn up the volume here, lower it there, and make life much more easy and comfortable. We'll give Ritalin to the distracted lawyer, Prozac to the guilty soldier and Cipralix to the dissatisfied wife. And that's just the beginning. Humanists are often appalled by this approach, but we had better not pass judgment on it too quickly. 
The humanist recommendation to listen to ourselves has ruined the lives of many a person, whereas the right dosage of the right chemical has greatly improved the well-being and relationships of millions. In order to really listen to themselves, some people must first turn down the volume of the inner screams and diatribes. According to modern psychiatry, many inner voices and authentic wishes are nothing more than the product of biochemical imbalances and neurological diseases. People suffering from clinical depression repeatedly walk out on promising careers and healthy relationships because some biochemical glitch makes them see everything through dark colored lenses. Instead of listening to such destructive inner voices, it might be a good idea to shut them up. When Sally Ady used the attention helmet to silence the voices in her head, she not only became an expert markswoman, but she also felt much better about herself. Personally, you may have many different views about these issues. Yet from a historical perspective it is clear that something momentous is happening. The number one humanist commandment, listen to yourself, is no longer self-evident. As we learn to turn our inner volume up and down, we give up our belief in authenticity, because it is no longer clear whose hand is on the switch. Silencing annoying noises inside your head seems like a wonderful idea, provided it enables you to finally hear your deep authentic self. But if there is no authentic self, how do you decide which voices to silence and which to amplify? Let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that within a few decades brain scientists will give us easy and accurate control over many inner voices. Imagine a young gay man from a devout Mormon family, who after years of living in the closet has finally accumulated enough money to finance a passion operation. He goes to the clinic armed with $100,000, determined to walk out of it as straight as Joseph Smith. Standing in front of the clinic's door, he mentally repeats what he is going to say to the doctor, Doc, here's $100,000. Please fix me so that I will never want men again. He then rings. The bell, and the door is opened by a real-life George Clooney. Doc, mumbles the overwhelmed lad, here's $100,000. Please fix me so that I will never want to be straight again. Did the young man's authentic self win over the religious brainwashing he underwent? Or perhaps a moment's temptation caused him to betray himself. And perhaps there is simply no such thing as an authentic self that you can follow or betray. Once people could design and redesign their will, we could no longer see it as the ultimate source of all meaning and authority. For no matter what our will says, we can always make it say something else. According to humanism, only human desires imbue the world with meaning. Yet if we could choose our desires, on what basis could we possibly make such choices? Suppose Romeo and Juliet opened with Romeo having to decide with whom to fall in love. And suppose even after making a decision, Romeo could always retract and make a different choice instead. What kind of play would it have been? Well, that's the play technological progress is trying to produce for us. When our desires make us uncomfortable, technology promises to bail us out. When the nail on which the entire universe hangs is pegged in a problematic spot, technology would pull it out and stick it somewhere else. But where exactly? If I could peg that nail anywhere in the cosmos, where should I peg it, and why there of all places? Humanist dramas unfold when people have uncomfortable desires. For example, it is extremely uncomfortable when Romeo of the House of Montague falls in love with Juliet of the House of Capulet, because the Montagues and Capulets are bitter enemies. The technological solution to such dramas is to make sure we never have uncomfortable desires. How much pain and sorrow would have been avoided if instead of drinking poison, Romeo and Juliet could just take a pill or wear a helmet that would have redirected their star-crossed love towards other people. Techno-humanism faces an impossible dilemma here. It considers the human will to be the most important thing in the universe, hence it pushes humankind to develop technologies that can control and redesign our will. After all, it's tempting to gain control over the most important thing in the world. Yet once we have such control, techno-humanism would not know what to do with it, because the sacred human will would become just another designer product. We can never deal with such technologies as long as we believe that the human will and the human experience are the supreme source of authority and meaning. Hence a bolder techno-religion seeks to sever the humanist umbilical cord altogether. It foresees a world which does not revolve around the desires and experiences of any human-like beings. What might replace desires and experiences as the source of all meaning and authority? As of 2016, only one candidate is sitting in history's reception room waiting for the job interview. This candidate is information. The most interesting emerging religion is dataism, which venerates neither gods nor man. It worships data. 
Chapter 11. The Data Religion. Dataism says that the universe consists of data flows, and the value of any phenomenon or entity is determined by its contribution to data processing. Point 1 This may strike you as some eccentric fringe notion, but in fact it has already conquered most of the scientific establishment. Dataism was born from the explosive confluence of two scientific tidal waves. In the 150 years since Charles Darwin, published on the origin of species, the life sciences have come to see organisms as biochemical algorithms. Simultaneously, in the eight decades since Alan Turing formulated the idea of a Turing machine, computer scientists have learned to engineer increasingly sophisticated electronic algorithms. Dataism puts the two together, pointing out that exactly the same mathematical laws apply to both biochemical and electronic algorithms. Dataism thereby collapses the barrier between animals and machines, and expects electronic algorithms to eventually decipher and outperform biochemical algorithms. For politicians, business people, and ordinary consumers, dataism offers groundbreaking technologies and immense new powers. For scholars and intellectuals it also promises to provide the scientific holy grail that has eluded us for centuries, a single overarching theory that unifies all the scientific disciplines from literature and musicology to economics and biology. According to dataism, King Lear and the flu virus are just two patterns of data flow that can be analyzed using the same basic concepts and tools. This idea is extremely attractive. It gives all scientists a common language, builds bridges over academic rifts and easily exports insights across disciplinary borders. Musicologists, political scientists, and cell biologists can finally understand each other. In the process, dataism inverts the traditional pyramid of learning. Hitherto, data was seen as only the first step in a long chain of intellectual activity. Humans were supposed to distill data into information, information into knowledge, and knowledge into wisdom. However, dataists believe that humans can no longer cope with the immense flows of data, hence they cannot distill data into information, let alone into knowledge or wisdom. The work of processing data should therefore be entrusted to electronic algorithms, whose capacity far exceeds that of the human brain. In practice, this means that dataists are skeptical about human knowledge and wisdom, and prefer to put their trust in big data and computer algorithms. Dataism is most firmly entrenched in its two mother disciplines, computer science and biology. Of the two, biology is the more important. It was the biological embracement of dataism that turned a limited breakthrough in computer science into a world-shattering cataclysm that may completely transform the very nature of life. You may not agree with the idea that organisms are algorithms, and that giraffes, tomatoes, and human beings are just different methods for processing data. But you should know that this is current scientific dogma, and that it is changing our world beyond recognition. Not only individual organisms are seen today as data processing systems, but also entire societies. Such as beehives, bacteria colonies, forests, and human cities. Economists increasingly interpret the economy, too as a data processing system. Lay people believe that the economy consists of peasants growing wheat, workers manufacturing clothes, and customers buying bread and underpants. Yet experts see the economy as a mechanism for gathering data about desires and abilities, and turning this data into decisions. According to this view, free market capitalism and state-controlled communism aren't competing ideologies, ethical creeds, or political institutions. At bottom, they are competing data processing systems. Capitalism uses distributed processing, whereas communism relies on centralized processing. Capitalism processes data by directly connecting all producers and consumers to one another, and allowing them to exchange information freely and make decisions independently. For example, how do you determine the price of bread in a free market? Well, every bakery may produce as much bread as it likes, and charge for it as much as it wants. The customers are equally free to buy as much bread as they can afford, or take their business to the competitor. It isn't illegal to charge $1,000 for a baguette, but nobody is likely to buy it. On a much grander scale, if investors predict increased demand for bread, they will buy shares of biotech firms that genetically engineer more prolific wheat strains. The inflow of capital will enable the firms to speed up their research, thereby providing more wheat faster, and averting bread shortages. Even if one biotech giant adopts a flawed theory and reaches an impasse, its more successful competitors will achieve the hoped for breakthrough. Free market capitalism thus distributes the work of analyzing data and making decisions between many independent but interconnected processors. 
As the Austrian economics guru Friedrich Hayek explained, in a system in which the knowledge of the relevant facts is dispersed among many people, prices can act to coordinate the separate actions of different people too. According to this view, the stock exchange is the fastest and most efficient data processing system humankind has so far created. Everyone is welcome to join, if not directly then through their banks or pension funds. The stock exchange runs the global economy, and takes into account everything that happens all over the planet, and even beyond it. Prices are influenced by successful scientific experiments, by political scandals in Japan, by volcanic eruptions in Iceland and even by irregular activities on the surface of the sun. In order for the system to run smoothly, as much information as possible needs to flow as freely as possible. When millions of people throughout the world have access to all the relevant information, they determine the most accurate price of oil, of Hyundai shares and of Swedish government bonds by buying and selling them. It has been estimated that the stock exchange needs just 15 minutes of trade to determine the influence of a New York Times headline. On the prices of most shares.3. Data processing considerations also explain why capitalists favor lower taxes. Heavy taxation means that a large part of all available capital accumulates in one place, the state coffers, and consequently more and more decisions have to be made by a single processor, namely the government. This creates an overly centralized data processing system. In extreme cases, when taxes are exceedingly high, almost all capital ends up in the government's hands, and so the government alone calls the shots. It dictates the price of bread, the location of bakeries, and the research and development budget. In a free market, if one processor makes a wrong decision, others will be quick to utilize its mistake. However, when a single processor makes almost all the decisions, mistakes can be catastrophic. This extreme situation in which all data is processed and all decisions are made by a single central processor is called communism. In a communist economy, people allegedly work according to their abilities, and receive according to their needs. In other words, the government takes 100 percent of your profits, decides what you need and then supplies these needs. Though no country ever realized this scheme in its extreme form, the Soviet Union and its satellites came as close as they could. They abandoned the principle of distributed data processing, and switched to a model of centralized data processing. All information from throughout the Soviet Union flowed to a single location in Moscow, where all the important decisions were made. Producers and consumers could not communicate directly, and had to obey government orders. For instance, the Soviet economics ministry might decide that the price of bread in all shops should be exactly 2 rubles and 4 kopecks, that a particular call cause in the Odessa Oblast should switch from growing wheat to raising chickens, and that the Red October bakery in Moscow should produce 3.5 million loaves of bread per day, and not a single loaf more. Meanwhile the Soviet science ministry forced all Soviet biotech laboratories to adopt the theories of Trofim Lysenko, the infamous head of the Lenin Academy for Agricultural Sciences. Lysenko rejected the dominant genetic theories of his day. He insisted that if an organism acquired some new trait during its lifetime, this quality could pass directly to its descendants. This idea flew in the face of Darwinian orthodoxy, but it dovetailed nicely with communist educational principles. It implied that if you could train wheat plants to withstand cold weather, their progenies will also be cold resistant. Lysenko accordingly sent billions of counter-revolutionary wheat plants to be re-educated in Siberia, and the Soviet Union was soon forced to import more and more flour from the United States. Point four. Capitalism did not defeat communism because capitalism was more ethical, because individual liberties are sacred or because God was angry with the heathen communists. Rather, capitalism won. The Cold War because distributed data processing works better than centralized data processing, at least in periods of accelerating technological changes. The Central Committee of the Communist Party just could not deal with the rapidly changing world of the late 20th century. When all data is accumulated in one secret bunker, and all important decisions are taken by a group of elderly operatics, you can produce nuclear bombs by the cartload, but you won't get an Apple or a Wikipedia. There is a story, probably apocryphal, like most good stories, that when Mikhail Gorbachev tried to resuscitate the moribund Soviet economy, he sent one of his chief aides to London to find out what Thatcherism was all about, and how a capitalist system actually functioned. The hosts took their Soviet visitor on a tour of the city, of the London Stock Exchange and of the London School of Economics, where he had lengthy talks with bank managers, entrepreneurs, and professors. 
After a few hours, the Soviet expert burst out, just one moment, please. Forget about all these complicated economic theories. We have been going back and forth across London for a whole day now, and there's one thing I cannot understand. Back in Moscow, our finest minds are working on the bread supply system, and yet there are such long queues in every bakery and grocery store. Here in London live millions of people, and we have passed today in front of many shops and supermarkets, yet I haven't seen a single bread queue. Please take me to meet the person in charge of supplying bread to London. I must learn his secret. The hosts scratched their heads, thought for a moment, and said, nobody is in charge of supplying bread to London. That's the capitalist secret of success. No central processing unit monopolises all the data on the London bread supply. The information flows freely between millions of consumers and producers, bakers and tycoons, farmers and scientists. Market forces determine the price of bread, the number of loaves baked each day and the research and development priorities. If market forces make the wrong decision, they soon correct themselves, or so capitalists believe. For our current purposes, it doesn't matter whether the theory is correct. The crucial thing is that the theory understands economics in terms of data processing. Where has all the power gone? Political scientists also increasingly interpret human political structures as data processing systems. Like capitalism and communism, so democracies and dictatorships are in essence competing mechanisms for gathering and analyzing information. Dictatorships use central east processing methods, whereas democracies prefer distributed processing. In the last decades democracy gained the upper hand because under the unique conditions of the late 20th century, distributed processing worked better. Under alternative conditions, those prevailing in the ancient Roman Empire, for instance, Central East processing had an edge, which is why the Roman Republic fell and power shifted from the Senate and popular assemblies into the hands of a single autocratic emperor. This implies that as data processing conditions change again in the 21st century, democracy might decline and even disappear. As both the volume and speed of data increase, venerable institutions like elections, parties, and parliaments might become obsolete, not because they are unethical, but because they don't process data efficiently enough. These institutions evolved in an era when politics moved faster than technology. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the Industrial Revolution unfolded slowly enough for politicians and voters to remain one step ahead of it and regulate and manipulate its course. Yet whereas the rhythm of politics has not changed much since the days of steam, technology has switched from first gear to fourth. Technological revolutions now outpace political processes, causing MPs and voters alike to lose control. The rise of the internet gives us a taste of things to come. Cyberspace is now crucial to our daily lives, our economy, and our security. Yet the critical choices between alternative web designs weren't taken through a democratic political process, even though they involved traditional political issues such as sovereignty, borders, privacy, and security. Did you ever vote about the shape of cyberspace? Decisions made by web designers far from the public limelight mean that today the internet is a free and lawless zone that erodes state sovereignty, ignores borders, abolishes privacy, and poses perhaps the most formidable global security risk. Whereas a decade ago it hardly registered on the radar, today hysterical officials are predicting an imminent cyber 9-11. Governments and NGOs consequently conduct intense debates about restructuring the internet, but it is much harder to change an existing system than to intervene at its inception. Besides, by the time the cumbersome government bureaucracy makes up its mind about cyber regulation, the internet has morphed ten times. The governmental tortoise cannot keep up with the technological hare. It is overwhelmed by data. The NSA may be spying on your every word, but to judge by the repeated failures of American foreign policy, nobody in Washington knows what to do with all the data. Never in history did a government know so much about what's going on in the world, yet few empires have botched things up as clumsily as the contemporary United States. It's like a poker player who knows what cards his opponents hold, yet somehow still manages to lose round after round. In the coming decades, it is likely that we will see more internet-like revolutions, in which technology steals a march on politics. Artificial intelligence and biotechnology might soon overhaul our societies and economies, and our bodies and minds too, but they are hardly a blip on our political radar. Our current democratic structures just cannot collect and process the relevant data fast enough, and most voters don't understand biology and cybernetics well enough to form any pertinent opinions. 
Hence traditional democratic politics loses control of events, and fails to provide us with meaningful visions for the future. That doesn't mean we will go back to 20th century style dictatorships. Authoritarian regimes seem to be equally overwhelmed by the pace of technological development and the speed and volume of the data flow. In the 20th century, dictators had grand visions for the future. Communists and fascists alike sought to completely destroy the old world and build a new world in its place. Whatever you think about Lenin, Hitler, or Mao, you cannot accuse them of lacking vision. Today it seems that leaders have a chance to pursue even grander visions. While communists and Nazis tried to create a new society and a new human with the help of steam engines and typewriters, today's prophets could rely on biotechnology and supercomputers. In science fiction films, ruthless Hitler-like politicians are quick to pounce on such new technologies, putting them in the service of this or that megalomaniac political ideal. Yet flesh and blood politicians in the early 21st century, even in authoritarian countries such as Russia, Iran, or North Korea, are nothing like their Hollywood counterparts. They don't seem to plot any brave new world. The wildest dreams of Kim Jong-un and Ali Khomeini don't go much beyond atom bombs and ballistic missiles, that is so 1945. Putin's aspirations seem confined to rebuilding the old Soviet zone, or the even older Tsarist empire. Meanwhile in the USA, paranoid Republicans accuse Barack Obama of being a ruthless despot hatching conspiracies to destroy the foundations of American society, yet in eight years of presidency he barely managed to pass a minor health care reform. Creating new worlds and new humans is far beyond his agenda. Precisely because technology is now moving so fast, and parliaments and dictators alike are overwhelmed by data they cannot process quickly enough, present-day politicians are thinking on a far smaller scale than their predecessors a century ago. In the early 21st century, politics is consequently bereft of grand visions. Government has become mere administration. It manages the country, but it no longer leads it. It makes sure teachers are paid on time and sewage systems don't overflow but it has no idea where the country will be in 20 years. To some extent, this is a very good thing. Given that some of the big political visions of the 20th century led us to Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and the Great Leap Forward, maybe we are better off in the hands of petty-minded bureaucrats. Mixing godlike technology with megalomaniac politics is a recipe for disaster. Many neoliberal economists and political scientists argue that it is best to leave all the important decisions in the hands of the free market. They thereby give politicians the perfect excuse for inaction and ignorance, which are reinterpreted as profound wisdom. Politicians find it convenient to believe that the reason they don't understand the world is that they need not understand it. Yet mixing godlike technology with myopic politics also has its downside. Lack of vision isn't always a blessing, and not all visions are necessarily bad. In the 20th century, the dystopian Nazi vision did not fall apart spontaneously. It was defeated by the equally grand visions of socialism and liberalism. It is dangerous to trust our future to market forces, because these forces do what's good for the market rather than what's good for humankind or for the world. The hand of the market is blind as well as invisible, and left to its own devices it may fail to do anything about the threat of global warming or the dangerous potential of artificial intelligence. Some people believe that there is somebody in charge after all. Not democratic politicians or autocratic despots, but rather a small coterie of billionaires who secretly run the world. But such conspiracy theories never work, because they underestimate the complexity of the system. A few billionaires smoking cigars and drinking scotch in some back room cannot possibly understand everything happening on the globe, let alone control it. Ruthless billionaires and small interest groups flourish in today's chaotic world not because they read the map better than anyone else, but because they have very narrow aims. In a chaotic system, Tunnel vision has its advantages, and the billionaire's power is strictly proportional to their goals. If the world's richest man would like to make another billion dollars he could easily game the system in order to achieve his goal. In contrast, if he would like to reduce global inequality or stop global warming, even he won't be able to do it, because the system is far too complex. Yet power vacuums seldom last long. If in the 21st century traditional political structures can no longer process the data fast enough to produce meaningful visions, then new and more efficient structures will evolve to take their place. These new structures may be very different from any previous political institutions, whether democratic or authoritarian. The only question is who will build and control these structures. If humankind is no longer up to the task, perhaps it might give somebody else a try.
History in a nutshell. From a dataist perspective, we may interpret the entire human species as a single data processing system, with individual humans serving as its chips. If so, we can also understand the whole of history as a process of improving the efficiency of this system, through four basic methods. 1. Increasing the number of processors. A city of 100,000 people has more computing power than a village of 1,000 people. 2. Increasing the variety of processors. Different processors may use diverse ways to calculate and analyze data. Using several kinds of processors in a single system may therefore increase its dynamism and creativity. A conversation between a peasant, a priest, and a physician may produce novel ideas that would never emerge from a conversation between three hunter-gatherers. 3. Increasing the number of connections between processors. There is little point in increasing the mere number and variety of processors if they are poorly connected to each other. A trade network linking 10 cities is likely to result in many more economic, technological, and social innovations than 10 isolated cities. 4. Increasing the freedom of movement along existing connections. Connecting processors is hardly useful if data cannot flow freely. Just building roads between 10 cities won't be very useful if they are plagued by robbers, or if some autocratic despot doesn't allow merchants and travelers to move as they wish. These four methods often contradict one another. The greater the number and variety of processors, the harder it is to freely connect them. The construction of the Sapiens data processing system accordingly passed through four main stages, each characterized by an emphasis on different methods. The first stage began with the cognitive revolution, which made it possible to connect unlimited numbers of Sapiens into a single data processing network. This gave Sapiens a crucial advantage over all other human and animal species. While there is a strict limit to the number of Neanderthals, chimpanzees or elephants you can connect to the same net, there is no limit to the number of sapiens. Sapiens used their advantage in data processing to overrun the entire world. However, as they spread into different lands and climates they lost touch with one another, and underwent diverse cultural transformations. The result was an immense variety of human cultures, each with its own lifestyle, behavior patterns, and world view. Hence the first phase of history involved an increase in the number and variety of human processors, at the expense of connectivity, 20,000 years ago there were many more sapiens than 70,000 years ago, and sapiens in Europe processed information differently to sapiens in China. However, there were no connections between people in Europe and China, and it would have seemed utterly impossible that all sapiens may one day be part of a single data processing web. The second stage began with the agricultural revolution and continued until the invention of writing and money about 5,000 years ago. Agriculture speeded demographic growth, so the number of human processors rose sharply. Simultaneously, agriculture enabled many more people to live together in the same place, thereby generating dense local networks that contained an unprecedented number of processors. In addition, Agriculture created new incentives and opportunities for different networks to trade and communicate with one another. Nevertheless, during the second phase centrifugal forces remained predominant. In the absence of writing and money, humans could not establish cities, kingdoms, or empires. Humankind was still divided into innumerable little tribes, each with its own lifestyle and world view. Uniting the whole of humankind was not even a fantasy. The third stage kicked off with the invention of writing and money about 5,000 years ago, and lasted until the beginning of the scientific revolution. Thanks to writing and money, the gravitational field of human cooperation finally overpowered the centrifugal forces. Human groups bonded and merged to form cities and kingdoms. Political and commercial links between different cities and kingdoms also tightened. At least since the first millennium BC, when coinage, empires, and universal religions appeared, humans began to consciously dream about forging a single network that would encompass the entire globe. This dream became a reality during the fourth and last stage of history, which began around 1492. Early modern explorers, conquerors, and traders wove the first thin threads that encompassed the whole world. In the late modern period these threads were made stronger and denser, so that the spider's web of Columbus's days became the steel and asphalt grid of the 21st century. Even more importantly, Information was allowed to flow increasingly freely along this global grid. When Columbus first hooked up the Eurasian net to the American net, only a few bits of data could cross the ocean each year, running the gauntlet of cultural prejudices, strict censorship and political repression. But as the years went by, the free market, the scientific community, 
the rule of law and the spread of democracy all helped to lift the barriers. We often imagine that democracy and the free market won because they were good. In truth, they won because they improved the global data processing system. So over the last 70,000 years humankind first spread out, then separated into distinct groups, and finally merged again. Yet the process of unification did not take us back to the beginning. When the different human groups fused into the global village of today, each brought along its unique legacy of thoughts, tools, and behaviors, which it collected and developed along the way. Our modern larders are now stuffed with Middle Eastern wheat, Andean potatoes, New Guinean sugar and Ethiopian coffee. Similarly, our language, religion, music and politics are replete with heirlooms from across. The Planet.5 If humankind is indeed a single data processing system, what is its output? Dataists would say that its output will be the creation of a new and even more efficient data processing system, called the Internet of all things. Once this mission is accomplished, Homo sapiens will vanish. Information wants to be free. Like capitalism, dataism too began as a neutral scientific theory, but is now mutating into a religion that claims to determine right and wrong. The supreme value of this new religion is, information flow. If life is the movement of information, and if we think that life is good, it follows that we should extend, deepen, and spread the flow of information in the universe. According to dataism, human experiences are not sacred and Homo sapiens isn't the apex of creation or a precursor of some future Homo deus. Humans are merely tools for creating the Internet of all things, which may eventually spread out from planet Earth to cover the whole galaxy and even the whole universe. This cosmic data processing system would be like God. It will be everywhere and will control everything, and humans are destined to merge into it. This vision is reminiscent of some traditional religious visions. Thus Hindus believe that humans can and should merge into the universal soul of the cosmos, the Atman. Christians believe that after death saints are filled by the infinite grace of God, whereas sinners cut themselves off from his presence. Indeed, in Silicon Valley the Dataist prophets consciously use traditional messianic language. For example, Ray Kurzweil's book of prophecies is called The Singularity is Near, echoing John the Baptist's cry, The Kingdom of Heaven is Near, Matthew 3 2. Dataists explain to those who still worship flesh and blood mortals that they are overly attached to outdated technology. Homo sapiens is an obsolete algorithm. After all, what's the advantage of humans over chickens? Only that in humans information flows in much more complex patterns than in chickens. Humans absorb more data, and process it using better algorithms. In day-to-day -day language that means that humans allegedly have deeper emotions and superior intellectual abilities. But remember that according to current biological dogma, emotions and intelligence are just algorithms. Well then, if we could create a data processing system that absorbs even more data than a human being, and that processes it even more efficiently, wouldn't that system be superior to a human in exactly the same way that a human is superior to a chicken? Dataism isn't limited to idle prophecies. Like every religion, it has its practical commandments. First and foremost, a dataist ought to maximize data flow by connecting to more and more media, and producing and consuming more and more information. Like other successful religions, Dataism is also missionary. Its second commandment is to connect everything to the system, including heretics who don't want to be connected. And everything means more than just humans. It means everything. My body, of course, but also the cars on the street, the refrigerators in the kitchen, the chickens in their coop and the trees in the jungle, all should be connected to the Internet of all things. The refrigerator will monitor the number of eggs in the drawer, and inform the chicken coop when a new shipment is needed. The cars will talk with one another, and the trees in the jungle will report on the weather and on carbon dioxide levels. We mustn't leave any part of the universe disconnected from the great web of life. Conversely, the greatest sin is to block the data flow. What is death, if not a situation when information doesn't flow? Hence dataism upholds the freedom of information as the greatest good of all. People rarely manage to come up with a completely new value. The last time this happened was in the 18th century, when the humanist revolution preached the stirring ideals of human liberty, human equality, and human fraternity. Since 1789, despite numerous wars, revolutions, and upheavals, humans have not managed to come up with any new value. All subsequent conflicts and struggles have been conducted either in the name of the three humanist values, or in the name of even older values such as obeying God or serving the nation.
Dataism is the first movement since 1789 that created a really novel value, freedom of information. We mustn't confuse freedom of information with the old liberal ideal of freedom of expression. Freedom of expression was given to humans, and protected their right to think and say what they wished, including their right to keep their mouths shut and their thoughts to themselves. Freedom of information, in contrast, is not given to humans. It is given to information. Moreover, this novel value may impinge on the traditional freedom of expression, by privileging the right of information to circulate freely over the right of humans to own data and to restrict its movement. On January 11, 2013, Dataism got its first martyr when Aaron Swartz, a 26-year-old American hacker, committed suicide in his apartment. Swartz was a rare genius. At 14, he helped develop the crucial RSS protocol. Swartz was also a firm believer in the freedom of information. In 2008 he published the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto that demanded a free and unlimited flow of information. Swartz said that we need to take information, wherever it is stored, make our copies and share them with the world. We need to take stuff that's out of copyright and add it to the archive. We need to buy secret databases and put them on the web. We need to download scientific journals and upload them to file sharing networks. We need to fight for guerrilla open access. Swartz was as good as his word. He became annoyed with the Jaster Digital Library for charging its customers. Jaster holds millions of scientific papers and studies, and believes in the freedom of expression of scientists and journal editors, which includes the freedom to charge a fee for reading. Their articles. According to Jaster, if I want to get paid for the ideas I created, it's my right to do so. Swartz thought otherwise. He believed that information wants to be free, that ideas don't belong to the people who created them, and that it is wrong to lock data behind walls and charge money for entrance. He used the MIT computer network to access Jaster, and downloaded hundreds of thousands of scientific papers, which he intended to release onto the internet, so that everybody could read them freely. Swartz was arrested and put on trial. When he realized he would probably be convicted and sent to jail, he hanged himself. Hackers reacted with petitions and attacks directed at the academic and governmental institutions that persecuted Swartz and that infringe on the freedom of information. Under pressure, Jaster apologized for its part in the tragedy, and today allows free access to much of its data, though not to all of it. Point 6. To convince septics, dataist missionaries repeatedly explain the immense benefits of the freedom of information. Just as capitalists believe that all good things depend on economic growth, so dataists believe all good things, including economic growth, depend on the freedom of information. Why did the USA grow faster than the USSR? Because information flowed more freely in the USA. Why are Americans healthier, wealthier, and happier than Iranians or Nigerians? Thanks to the freedom of information. So if we want to create a better world, the key is to set the data free. We have already seen that Google can detect new epidemics faster than traditional health organizations, but only if we allow it free access to the information we are producing. A free data flow can similarly reduce pollution and waste, for example by rationalizing the transportation system. In 2010 the number of private cars in the world exceeded 1 billion, and it has since kept growing. Point seven. These cars pollute the planet and waste enormous resources, not least by necessitating ever wider roads and parking spaces. People have become so used to the convenience of private transport that they are unlikely to settle for buses and trains. However, dataists point out that people really want mobility rather than a private car, and a good data processing system can provide this mobility far more cheaply and efficiently. I have a private car, but most of the time it sits idly in the car park. On a typical day, I enter my car at 8.04, and drive for half an hour to the university, where I park my car for the day. At 18.11 I come back to the car, drive half an hour back home, and that's it. So I am using my car for just an hour a day. Why do I need to keep it for the other 23 hours? We can create a smart carpool system, run by computer algorithms. The computer would know that I need to leave home at 8.04, and would route the nearest autonomous car to pick me up at that precise moment. After dropping me off at campus, it would be available for other uses instead of waiting in the car park. At 18.11 sharp, as I leave the university gate, another communal car would stop right in front of me, and take me home. In such a way, 50 million communal autonomous cars may replace 1 billion private cars, and we would also need far fewer roads, bridges, tunnels and parking spaces. Provided, 
of course, I renounce my privacy and allow the algorithms to always know where I am and where I want to go. Record, upload, share. But maybe you don't need convincing, especially if you are under 20. People just want to be part of the data flow, even if that means giving up their privacy, their autonomy, and their individuality. Humanist art sanctifies the individual genius, and a Picasso doodle on a napkin nets millions it. Sotheby's. Humanist science glorifies the individual researcher, and every scholar dreams of putting his or her name at the top of a science or nature paper. But a growing number of artistic and scientific creations are nowadays produced by the ceaseless collaboration of everyone. Who writes Wikipedia? All of us. The individual is becoming a tiny chip inside a giant system that nobody really understands. Every day I absorb countless data bits through emails, phone calls, and articles, process the data, and transmit back new bits through more emails, phone calls, and articles. I don't really know where I fit into the great scheme of things, and how my bits of data connect with the bits produced by billions of other humans and computers. I don't have time to find out, because I am too busy answering all the emails. And as I process more data more efficiently, answering more emails, making more phone calls and writing more articles, so the people around me are flooded by even more data. This relentless flow of data sparks new inventions and disruptions that nobody plans, controls or comprehends. No one understands how the global economy functions or where global politics is heading. But no one needs to understand. All you need to do is answer your emails faster, and allow the system to read them. Just as free market capitalists believe in the invisible hand of the market, so dataists believe in the invisible hand of the data flow. As the global data processing system becomes all-knowing and all-powerful, so connecting to the system becomes the source of all meaning. Humans want to merge into the data flow because when you are part of the data flow you are part of something much bigger than yourself. Traditional religions told you that your every word and action was part of some great cosmic plan, and that God watched you every minute and cared about all your thoughts and feelings. Data religion now says that your every word and action is part of the great data flow, that the algorithms are constantly watching you and that they care about everything you do and feel. Most people like this very much. For true believers, to be disconnected from the data flow risks losing the very meaning of life. What's the point of doing or experiencing anything if nobody knows about it, and if it doesn't contribute something to the global exchange of information? Humanism thought that experiences occur inside us, and that we ought to find within ourselves the meaning of all that happens, thereby infusing the universe with meaning. Dataists believe that experiences are valueless if they are not shared, and that we need not, indeed cannot, find meaning within ourselves. We need only record and connect our experience to the great data flow, and the algorithms will discover its meaning and tell us what to do. Twenty years ago Japanese tourists were a universal laughing stock because they always carried cameras and took pictures of everything in sight. Now everyone is doing it. If you go to India and see an elephant, you don't look at the elephant and ask yourself, what do I feel? You are too busy looking for your smartphone, taking a picture of the elephant, posting it on Facebook and then checking your account every two minutes to see how many likes you got. Writing a private diary, a common humanist practice in previous generations, sounds to many present-day youngsters utterly pointless. Why write anything if nobody else can read it? The new motto says, if you experience something, record it. If you record something, upload it. If you upload something, share it. Throughout this book we have repeatedly asked what makes humans superior to other animals. Dataism has a new and simple answer. In themselves, human experiences are not superior at all to the experiences of wolves or elephants. One bit of data is as good as another. However, a human can write a poem about his experience and post it online, thereby enriching the global data processing system. That makes his bits count. A wolf cannot do this. Hence all of the wolf's experiences, as deep and complex as they may be, are worthless. No wonder we are so busy converting our experiences into data. It isn't a question of trendiness. It is a question of survival. We must prove to ourselves and to the system that we still have value. And value lies not in having experiences, but in turning these experiences into free-flowing data. By the way, wolves, or at least their dog cousins, aren't a hopeless case. A company called No More Woof is developing a helmet for reading canine experiences. 
The helmet monitors the dog's brain waves, and uses computer algorithms to translate simple messages such as, I am angry, into human language. Point 8 Your dog may soon have a Facebook or Twitter account of his own, perhaps with more likes and followers than you. Know thyself. Dataism is neither liberal nor humanist. It should be emphasized, however, that dataism isn't anti-humanist. It has nothing against human experiences. It just doesn't think they are intrinsically valuable. When we surveyed the three main humanist sects, we asked which experience is the most valuable, listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, to Chuck Berry, to a pygmy initiation song or to the howl of a wolf in heat. A dataist would argue that the entire exercise is misguided, because music should be evaluated according to the data it carries rather than according to the experience it creates. A dataist may argue, for example, that the Fifth Symphony carries far more data than the pygmy initiation song, because it uses more chords and scales, and creates dialogues with many more musical styles. Consequently, you need far more computational power to decipher the Fifth Symphony, and you gain far more knowledge from doing so. Music, according to this view, is mathematical patterns. Mathematics can describe every musical piece, as well as the relations between any two pieces. Hence you can measure the precise data value of every symphony, song, and howl, and determine which is the richest. The experiences they create in humans or wolves don't really matter. True, for the last 70,000 years or so, human experiences have been the most efficient data processing algorithms in the universe, hence there was good reason to sanctify them. However, we may soon reach a point when these algorithms will be superseded, and even become a burden. Sapiens evolved in the African savanna tens of thousands of years ago, and their algorithms are just not built to handle 21st century data flows. We might try to upgrade the human data processing system, but this may not be enough. The Internet of all things may soon create such huge and rapid data flows that even upgraded human algorithms cannot handle it. When the car replaced the horse-drawn carriage, we didn't upgrade the horses, we retired them. Perhaps it is time to do the same with Homo sapiens. Dataism adopts a strictly functional approach to humanity, appraising the value of human experiences according to their function in data processing mechanisms. If we develop an algorithm that fulfills the same function better, human experiences will lose their value. Thus if we can replace not just taxi drivers and doctors but also lawyers, poets, and musicians with superior computer programs, why should we care if these programs have no consciousness and no subjective experiences? If some humanist starts adulating the sacredness of human experience, dataists would dismiss such sentimental humbug. The experience you praise is just an outdated biochemical algorithm. In the African savanna 70,000 years ago, that algorithm was state of the art. Even in the 20th century it was vital for the army and for the economy. But soon we will have much better algorithms. In the climactic scene of many Hollywood science fiction movies, humans face an alien invasion fleet, an army of rebellious robots or an all-knowing supercomputer that wants to obliterate them. Humanity seems doomed. But at the very last moment, against all the odds, humanity triumphs thanks to something that the aliens, the robots, and the supercomputers didn't suspect and cannot fathom, love. The hero, who up till now has been easily manipulated by the supercomputer and has been riddled with bullets by the evil robots, is inspired by his sweetheart to make a completely unexpected move that turns the tables on the thunderstruck matrix. Dataism finds such scenarios utterly ridiculous. Come on, it admonishes the Hollywood screenwriters, is that all you could come up with? Love? And not even some platonic cosmic love, but the carnal attraction between two mammals? Do you really think that an all-knowing supercomputer or aliens who managed to conquer the entire galaxy would be dumbfounded by a hormonal rush? By equating the human experience with data patterns, dataism undermines our main source of authority and meaning, and heralds a tremendous religious revolution, the like of which has not been seen since the 18th century. In the days of Locke, Hume, and Voltaire humanists argued that, God is a product of the human imagination. Dataism now gives humanists a taste of their own medicine, and tells them, yes, God is a product of the human imagination, but human imagination in turn is the product of biochemical algorithms. In the 18th century, humanism sidelined God by shifting from a deocentric to a homocentric worldview. In the 21st century, dataism may sideline humans by shifting from a homocentric to a datacentric view. The dataist revolution will probably take a few decades, if not a century or two.
But then the humanist revolution too did not happen overnight. At first, humans kept on believing in God, and argued that humans are sacred because they were created by God for some divine purpose. Only much later did some people dare say that humans are sacred in their own right, and that God doesn't exist at all. Similarly, today most dataists say that the internet of all things is sacred because humans are creating it to serve human needs. But eventually, the internet of all things may become sacred in its own right. The shift from a homocentric to a data-centric worldview won't be merely a philosophical revolution. It will be a practical revolution. All truly important revolutions are practical. The humanist idea that, humans invented God, was significant because it had far-reaching practical implications. Similarly, the dataist idea that organisms are algorithms is significant due to its day-to-day -day practical consequences. Ideas change the world only when they change our behavior. In ancient Babylon, when people faced a difficult dilemma they climbed to the top of the local temple in the darkness of night and observed the sky. The Babylonians believed that the stars control our fate and predict our future. By watching the stars the Babylonians decided whether to get married, plow the field and go to war. Their philosophical beliefs were translated into very practical procedures. Scriptural religions such as Judaism and Christianity told a different story, the stars are lying. God, who created the stars, revealed the entire truth in the Bible. So stop observing the stars, read the Bible instead. This too was a practical recommendation. When people didn't know whom to marry, what career to choose and whether to start a war, they read the Bible and followed its counsel. Next came the humanists, with an altogether new story, humans invented God, wrote the Bible and then interpreted it in a thousand different ways. So humans themselves are the source of all truth. You may read the Bible as an inspiring human creation, but you don't have to. If you are facing any dilemma, just listen to yourself and follow your inner voice. Humanism then gave detailed practical instructions on how to listen to yourself, recommending things such as watching sunsets, reading Goethe, keeping a private diary, having heart-to-heart -heart talks with a good friend and holding democratic elections. For centuries scientists too accepted these humanist guidelines. When physicists wondered whether to get married or not, they too watched sunsets and tried to get in touch with themselves. When chemists contemplated whether to accept a problematic job offer, they too wrote diaries and had heart-to-heart -heart talks with a good friend. When biologists debated whether to wage war or sign a peace treaty, they too voted in democratic elections. When brain scientists wrote books about their startling discoveries, they often put an inspiring Goethe quote on the first page. This was the basis for the modern alliance between science and humanism, which kept the delicate balance between the modern yang and the modern yin, between reason and emotion, between the laboratory and the museum, between the production line and the supermarket. The scientists not only sanctified human feelings, but also found an excellent evolutionary reason to do so. After Darwin, biologists began explaining that feelings are complex algorithms honed by evolution to help animals make the right decisions. Our love, our fear, and our passion aren't some nebulous spiritual phenomena good only for composing poetry. Rather, they encapsulate millions of years of practical wisdom. When you read the Bible, you get advice from a few priests and rabbis who lived in ancient Jerusalem. In contrast, when you listen to your feelings, you follow an algorithm that evolution has developed for millions of years, and that withstood the harshest quality tests of natural selection. Your feelings are the voice of millions of ancestors, each of whom managed to survive and reproduce in an unforgiving environment. Your feelings are not infallible, of course, but they are better than most alternatives. For millions upon millions of years, feelings were the best algorithms in the world. Hence in the days of Confucius, of Muhammad, or of Stalin, people should have listened to their feelings rather than to the teachings of Confucianism, Islam, or Communism. Yet in the 21st century, Feelings are no longer the best algorithms in the world. We are developing superior algorithms which utilize unprecedented computing power and giant databases. The Google and Facebook algorithms not only know exactly how you feel, they also know a million other things about you that you hardly suspect. Consequently you should now stop listening to your feelings, and start listening to these external algorithms instead. What's the use of having democratic elections when the algorithms know how each person is going to vote, and when they also know the exact neurological reasons why one person votes Democrat while another votes Republican? Whereas humanism commanded, listen to your feelings. Dataism now commands, listen to the algorithms. They know how you feel. 
when you contemplate whom to marry, which career to pursue and whether to start a war, dataism tells you it would be a total waste of time to climb a high mountain and watch the sun setting on the waves. It would be equally pointless to go to a museum, write a private diary or have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with a friend. Yes, in order to make the right decisions you must get to know yourself better. But if you want to know yourself in the 21st century, there are much better methods than climbing mountains, going to museums or writing diaries. Here are some practical dataist guidelines for you. You want to know who you really are, asks dataism. Then forget about mountains and museums. Have you had your DNA sequenced? No. What are you waiting for? Go and do it today. And convince your grandparents, parents, and siblings to have their DNA sequenced too, their data is very valuable for you. And have you heard about these wearable biometric devices that measure your blood pressure and heart rate 24 hours a day? Good, so buy one of those, put it on and connect it to your smartphone. And while you are shopping, buy a mobile camera and microphone. Record everything you do, and put in online. And allow Google and Facebook to read all your emails, monitor all your chats and messages, and keep a record of all your likes and clicks. If you do all that, then the great algorithms of the Internet of all things will tell you whom to marry, which career to pursue and whether to start a war. But where do these great algorithms come from? This is the mystery of dataism. Just as according to Christianity we humans cannot understand God and his plan, so dataism says the human brain cannot embrace the new master algorithms. At present, of course, the algorithms are mostly written by human hackers. Yet the really important algorithms, such as the Google search algorithm, are developed by huge teams. Each member understands just one part of the puzzle, and nobody really understands the algorithm as a whole. Moreover, with the rise of machine learning and artificial neural networks, more and more algorithms evolve independently, improving themselves and learning from their own mistakes. They analyze astronomical amounts of data, which no human can possibly encompass, and learn to recognize patterns and adopt strategies that escape the human mind. The seed algorithm may initially be developed by humans, but as it grows, it follows its own path, going where no human has gone before, and where no human can follow. A ripple in the data flow. Dataism naturally has its critics and heretics. As we saw in Chapter 3, it's doubtful whether life can really be reduced to data flows. In particular, at present we have no idea how or why data flows could produce consciousness and subjective experiences. Maybe we'll have a good explanation in 20 years. But maybe we'll discover that organisms aren't algorithms after all. It is equally doubtful whether life boils down to decision making. Under dataist influence, both the life sciences and the social sciences have become obsessed with decision making processes, as if that's all there is to life. But is it so? Sensations, emotions, and thoughts certainly play an important part in making decisions, but is that their sole meaning? Dataism gains a better and better understanding of decision making processes, but it might be adopting an increasingly skewed view of life. A critical examination of the dataist dogma is likely to be not only the greatest scientific challenge of the 21st century, but also the most urgent political and economic project. Scholars in the life sciences and social sciences should ask themselves whether we miss anything when we understand life as data processing and decision making. Is there perhaps something in the universe that cannot be reduced to data? Suppose non-conscious algorithms could eventually outperform conscious intelligence in all known data processing tasks, what, if anything, would be lost by replacing conscious intelligence with superior non-conscious algorithms? Of course, even if dataism is wrong and organisms aren't just algorithms, it won't necessarily prevent dataism from taking over the world. Many previous religions gained enormous popularity and power despite their factual mistakes. If Christianity and communism could do it, why not dataism? Dataism has especially good prospects, because it is currently spreading across all scientific disciplines. A unified scientific paradigm may easily become an unassailable dogma. It is very difficult to contest a scientific paradigm, but up till now, no single paradigm was adopted by the entire scientific establishment. Hence scholars in one field could always import heretical views from outside. But if everyone from musicologists to biologists uses the same dataist paradigm, interdisciplinary excursions will serve only to strengthen the paradigm further. Consequently even if the paradigm is flawed, it would be extremely difficult to resist it. If dataism succeeds in conquering the world, what will happen to us humans? In the beginning, 
it will probably accelerate the humanist pursuit of health, happiness, and power. Dataism spreads itself by promising to fulfill these humanist aspirations. In order to gain immortality, bliss, and divine powers of creation, we need to process immense amounts of data, far beyond the capacity of the human brain. So the algorithms will do it for us. Yet once authority shifts from humans to algorithms, the humanist projects may become irrelevant. Once we abandon the homocentric worldview in favor of a data-centric worldview, human health and happiness may seem far less important. Why bother so much about obsolete data processing machines when much better models are already in existence? We are striving to engineer the Internet of all things in the hope that it will make us healthy, happy, and powerful. Yet once the Internet of all things is up and running, we might be reduced from engineers to chips, then to data, and eventually we might dissolve within the data torrent like a clump of earth within a gushing river. Dataism thereby threatens to do to Homo sapiens what Homo sapiens has done to all other animals. In the course of history humans have created a global network, and evaluated everything according to its function within the network. For thousands of years, this boosted human pride and prejudices. Since humans fulfilled the most important functions in the network, it was easy for us to take credit for the network's achievements, and to see ourselves as the apex of creation. The lives and experiences of all other animals were undervalued, because they fulfilled far less important functions, and whenever an animal ceased to fulfill any function at all, it went extinct. However, once humans lose their functional importance to the network, we will discover that we are not the apex of creation after all. The yardsticks that we ourselves have enshrined will condemn us to join the mammoths and the Chinese river dolphins in oblivion. Looking back, humanity will turn out to be just a ripple within the cosmic data flow. We cannot really predict the future. All the scenarios outlined in this book should be understood as possibilities rather than prophecies. When we think about the future, our horizons are usually constrained by present-day ideologies and social systems. Democracy encourages us to believe in a democratic future, Capitalism doesn't allow us to envisage a non-capitalist alternative, and humanism makes it difficult for us to imagine a post-human destiny. At most, we sometimes recycle past events and think about them as alternative futures. For example, 20th century Nazism and communism serve as a blueprint for many dystopian fantasies, and science fiction authors use medieval and ancient legacies to imagine Jedi Knights and galactic emperors fighting it out with spaceships and laser guns. This book traces the origins of our present-day conditioning in order to loosen its grip and enable us to think in far more imaginative ways about our future. Instead of narrowing our horizons by forecasting a single definitive scenario, the book aims to broaden our horizons and make us aware of a much wider spectrum of options. As I have repeatedly emphasized, nobody really knows what the job market, the family, or the ecology will look like in 2050, or what religions, economic systems, or political structures will dominate the world. Yet broadening our horizons can backfire by making us more confused and inactive than before. With so many scenarios and possibilities, what should we pay attention to? The world is changing faster than ever before, and we are flooded by impossible amounts of data, of ideas, of promises, and of threats. Humans relinquish authority to the free market, to crowd wisdom and to external algorithms partly because they cannot deal with the deluge of data. In the past, censorship worked by Blocking the flow of information. In the 21st century, censorship works by flooding people with irrelevant information. People just don't know what to pay attention to, and they often spend their time investigating and debating side issues. In ancient times having power meant having access to data. Today having power means knowing what to ignore. So of everything that happens in our chaotic world, what should we focus on? If we think in term of months, we had probably focus on immediate problems such as the turmoil in the Middle East, the refugee crisis in Europe and the slowing of the Chinese economy. If we think in terms of decades, then global warming, growing inequality and the disruption of the job market loom large. Yet if we take the really grand view of life, all other problems and developments are overshadowed by three interlinked processes. One science is converging on an all-encompassing dogma, which says that organisms are algorithms, and life is data processing. Two intelligence is decoupling from consciousness. Three non-conscious but highly intelligent algorithms may soon know us better than we know ourselves. These three processes raise three key questions, which I hope will stick in your mind long after you have finished this book. One are organisms really just algorithms, and is life really just data processing? Two what's more valuable, 
intelligence or consciousness. 3. What will happen to society, politics, and daily life when non-conscious but highly intelligent algorithms know us better than we know ourselves? About the author. Yuval Noah Harari has a PhD in history from the University of Oxford and now lectures at the Department of History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, specializing in world history. His first book, Sapiens, was translated into 26 languages and became a bestseller in the US, UK, France, China, Korea, and numerous other countries. In 2010 he became president of the Royal Society of Literature. He lives in London. Also by Yuval Noah Harari. Sapiens. A Brief History of Humankind.